to know what this plug comes up to through slowly expiring. I didn't really realize that the doctor from the culture is the main thing. That's when they have to pre existing condition. No, well, pre existing condition, but also the right time management. Once you meet that million dollar limit, no, so it's just like a And it's what? Then this, yeah, because my uh, that's my computer part. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to make well, sure that we're yeah, it's not computer spots. So there is no. Okay, let me get my coffee. Off. This is what I don't want us to have. A, oh, yeah, okay, okay. But give me one quick second. And let arrange this in a way that will be okay. conducive. Uh, All right, there you go. Good. You know, I'm making some progress here. Okay, so you want the owl, you want the owl to show the speakers, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So the thing about the owl, right? Like you got to think about how this thing works. It has a three hundred. Yeah. It has a three hundred sixty degree yeah. viewpoint, but if you it's placed behind the speakers, it's never going to show the speakers' faces. If that makes sense. Right. So the ideal placement for this owl. Is that here? I don't. How are we going to get it there? I don't know that we can. That's why I'm letting you know. Like in terms of the way that this is conceptualized, this is not ideal. Right. I know. So, um, all right. So first, let's go ahead and unplug this from here, and then let's see. So this is your laptop, and that's okay. what we're going to run the program from. Yep. Problem. Give me a quick second here. Thank you. Oh, good. And you're already connected. Good. 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 Okay, that's where we're gonna leave that. Now, it's uh, I'm doing this. I'm doing your. We're all trying to get I'm so glad you know what you're doing. I don't, but I'm figuring it out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, you play it very well. <laughs> um, grab that little table for me. We're going to try to make use of that table. This is the oh. um, one from ODL. Great. You can just set it aside. No. Will you need to do anything with your computer or is this literally just for people to remote in? I don't know. Yeah. So I was probably going to try to stay over here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The ideal would be to have. <laughs> So he's checking chat. Yep. Checking chat or he's, he's checking chat. Um, he's Ruth good. is going to be online. She is also going to check chat. Lakeisha's going to check chat. We got a couple of people that are checking chat. Is Ruth person? No, she's, she's not So, how many people do we need checking chat? I would say at least two on site. Yeah. Well, Lakeisha. Yeah. You don't have the link to Zoom. I was connecting. Yeah. All right, this is what's connecting to your computer. Yeah. I try to slide this over just a little bit more on it. Excuse me. Excuse me. I just sent it to you. Where did she go? Oh, look at that. You have a different connection than I do. That's so mm -hmm. interesting. How about that? Y'all have a nicer owl than we do. We just got that one. 
probably why your owl is probably <laughs> a different version. We just got that one like two weeks ago. Now, let's see. All right. Is it the prettiest setup in the world? It is not. It should be functional. Now let's go ahead and take a look. Are we online? Yeah. May I take a look at your machine here? How is this too? Um, it probably cannot really, it won't go up. Yeah, I did take a look at that. I'll see, I have a box. So again, is it the prettiest setup in the world? It is not, but meeting out is what we want. What are we presenting on here? Zoom. Just, we're not doing a presentation at all. No, no, I just mean oh. we're using Zoom. Zoom. Yeah. I'm already in it. Yeah, so oh. that's what I'm trying to figure out though is. Yeah. Oh, okay, I, yeah. let's. We're gonna turn on this video. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. So. So here's what we're seeing now. I'll move it over here. All right. So here's your audience view. Right. They can see the podium. I am a speaker. I am talking. I am a panel member. I am saying extremely important things. I'm sorry. How about from this chair? Oh yeah, yeah. Ramona, please go. Go for it. The owl is going to track whoever's speaking. The eye is literally going to follow anyone who's speaking. Okay, Ramona. Okay. Welcome. How are you doing today? In fact, I disagree with you. Here is my perspective. Important words being said. Okay. Now, now, no arguing. Okay. <laughs> you see how it works? Yeah. Right. Good. Yeah. That's All right. right. So as I said, look, is it the most aesthetically pleasing setup that I've created for you? It is, I, I admittedly not, but will this function? It absolutely will uh, function. Um, I don't necessarily, I, based on the fact that it's picking, it picking you up at your, at your shoulder height and then it's picking up the panel members, I would probably leave the setup as is. Um, I can place a box here and place this a little bit higher. Um, I call it the owl perch. It is an old, yeah. it is an old brochure box, <laughs> and I wrote owl perch on it. Yeah. People get trying to throw away because it's old brochures. I'm like, no, no, this is a functional box. Do you want it higher? Do you want to see what it looks like higher? Let me grab. I have a box right here. So this the one? owl came in, so you yeah. can use that as a perch box if you want. Not just yet. This is very good for the level of the speakers. It, yeah, it it's is. good for the level of the speakers. And if people are seated, right? What you have to imagine people will be seated, then that will be then that will be good. Um, I think the, the concern that I have, let's see. So do we have anyone who can connect to this link remotely so that we can see what you know outside yeah, of this send room? It to Amy. Amy. <laughs> Hello, yes. yes. I have an extension. Hey, Dave. Yes. Hey, Dave. Can you get Amy? Can you get Amy? Amy is on. Amy. Amy. Seeing now that Amy is a brand new device. Lakeisha. I'm sorry. There's like noise behind me, so I can't hear. There is. I'll let them know. Hey, Lakeisha. Can you get on the so we can see what you see? I sent you the link. Oh, yeah. We're using that? Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, then we'll just leave her in the lobby just now. Okay, I need Amy to get in so okay. I can make her. No problem. So we just need Amy to log in. Yeah. And then we want to make sure that um, her volume is down there like that. Like, hey, Amy, make sure when you log in that your volume is muted. Your speakers are muted. So good. So D, D Marsh will be joining us, but she's a participant. So she's still in the waiting room. But we we won't be able to see that until I let her in and we can control the yeah. uh, let in. Yep. So you're up here next to me. Okay. Uh, this is disabled, so this is not a hot mic anymore. Hello? Um, do you want this to be a hot mic? No. Great. Then no problem. And that's disabled. We'll wait for Amy to get in. Let me get my stuff out of your way. No, it's just one of our speakers. I need Lakeisha to get in. Yeah, I have a feeling it's going to be that one line and that one. I can. It's the only display of here. What I think, Amy, what I think would be helpful if you could, you're you're not plugged in or anything like that, right? That should be very good. You are? I would say very nice. <laughs> no, but I, I copied y'all on all of it, but I'll send it again. I'm about to send it right to you. There, sent. Okay, who's talking? Ramona or Jose? Jose, say something. Jose, if you're talking in the speaker, I cannot hear you. I'm about to make her co host. Yeah, yeah. And I'm I can over hear, there and sit. I can hear y'all right now. And um, I've already made it. You can hear us. I don't know. She's left her station. Oh, that's right. I oh. asked her to leave her station. Oh, Amy, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you from there. Perfect. Good. And you can see everything. I'm just going to turn up the volume here. Amy, can I get one more sound check from you? Yeah, I can hear you and okay. see you. And I see Thank you. We're good. But I cannot see, I cannot hear him when he uses the mic. What? When Jose uses the mic, I can't hear him. Jose, she, she said you can't, she can't hear you. She can't hear me? No. no. Not with the mic when you walk around. Sorry, say, say that again. 
Not with the handheld mic. I cannot hear you with the handheld mic. Oh, I don't have the handheld oh, with mic. The, the handheld mic is right over here. Okay. We don't yeah. have that on yet. I thought he was testing that. Yes. That's because it's picking up the owl. We're using the Oh, no. So just be aware. All right. If remote, if you have people who are... Um, let, let me let me make this one change. All right, so we can. So we can. There, I made you post. Okay. Can I make a change for you. Yeah, go ahead. No, Lakeisha, you need to turn your speakers off. Yeah, no audio and, and mute your mute your speakers. No audio. Yeah, no audio yeah. whatsoever. Turn and it make sure your microphone is down. You want me to admit people? One second. Not, I don't um, think not uh, yet, uh, right? It's, uh, uh, one of my it's just, early in the um, Microphone array, real tech, same as the system, microphone. <laughs> Yeah. Jose, I'm going to have some friends yeah. over here. Wonderful. All right. So let's see. So Amy, can you Are you checking the mic? I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, I'm sure you can hear the entire room. You have to I can. Yeah. That's right. I mean, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear Carol real well. Yeah. Yes, I want. We have a Yeah, you guys sat Okay, that's coming. Yeah, just big one of the well, we have a we have heard that. Yeah, I can hear. Can I come back in or do you need me to stay out here a little longer? Yeah. Jose? Yes. You need me out here a little longer or are we done testing? Oh, no, no, we're good. We're good. Just make sure when you come before you come back that you keep your microphone. Yep. Turning it all off. Yep. Start up. It's already up. Yeah. 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 Very good. Do you want me to start a Do you want me to start a Yeah, Jose, do you want to display the room?
in full. Where's your son? Okay. Neil, I don't have Adam up there, but we'll be calling on him. Um, if I need to talk, say something, yeah. you let me know. Otherwise, I'll sit here and learn. Okay, and is Adam here? I don't think he's here yet. I haven't seen the project. We didn't write together. Oh, okay. Okay. So we actually are picking a general project right, for right now for our contract. So we're admitting people to the room, right? We're just trying to start the process. Yeah. Our objectives are pretty good. Really large scale food rate. Yeah, I can't. I'm talking about the mechanism. This year. Exactly. Now, we I'm excited y'all are going to tell us all the solutions, right? <laughs> yeah. We are going to save the
because they've done a wonderful job sponsoring this. And uh, Ramona Branch has really worked very hard on this. Amy should. Um, this project is a joint effort of the seven local CPAC civil lines. Um, CPAC is Community and Family, no, Consumer and Family Advisory Committee. If you don't know what that is, check it out online and you might become a member. Um, this is being recorded, right? Okay, we are now being recorded. Uh, please dump all your stuff in the chat, those of you online. Um, we will be using that chat extensively. So put every thought, question, comment in there. We will probably get to some of you, but whatever you put in there is going to be saved and read carefully. Um, all right. Uh, I want to just name uh, first our VIP uh, invitees. Uh, the legislators are Representative Alan Quancy, and hopefully Representative Donald White is online. Um, Senator Lisa Grafstein is here. Uh, Representative Renee Price, and hopefully uh, Representative Zach Hawkins uh, is at the uh, is online with us. <laughs> These are all great champions. Um, also, we have some VIPs from various agencies. Um, I don't, I don't see Ginger Yarbrough yet. She's back there. Uh, uh, Ann Oshel. She's back there. Back there, okay, Ann. Um, and we have uh, Tara Easley online. <laughs> yep. From uh, NC Medicaid and Keisha Purvis. There you are. Um, from uh, the Housing Finance Agency program, NCHFA. Uh, we also have Tally Wells from the DD Council and John Nash uh, from the Art of North Carolina. Um, and then I am, I don't know what she looks like, but Sunila Chilukuria, that's your name? Sunila. Sunila. Sunila, yeah. Okay. Uh, she is. Uh, very nicely joining us as um, from the Attorney General's office as legis legislative liaison. And that may be quite important for us later. Um, so, come on. Um, I'm going to be your first moderator. My name is Carol Conway. I wear long hats, but today I'm going to be wearing a hat of a CPAC, a local CPAC chair, chair of Orange County CPAC. Um, and what are the outcomes that we're expecting? Expecting a shared, raised understanding of what these issues are and identifying some solutions. So, white is on. Oh, good. Oh, Representative White, thank you for being with us. Um, so, first, a few instructions. One, this will be a calm discussion, uh, no long rants or whatever. Um, and online, I, I already asked you, and I'll repeat please put everything that you can into the chat um, because we're going to save it and read it very carefully. Um, format. Uh, with our planning group, we established that there are eight different buckets of barriers. We, we didn't want to get into the weeds of each project, so we decided to go barrier by barrier. There is overlap, um, so don't worry about us moving from one barrier to the next too quickly. We will have a chance to cover everything, I hope. We're going to devote 15 minutes to each barrier, a bucket, uh, and then we'll have dialogue, hopefully limited to like 30 to 60 seconds from each person. Um, it may not work out that way, but we'll try it. Um, I'll be asking our parent panels first, and then I'll turn to our VIPs if they have anything to add or respond, and then I'll open it up to the, the general audience. Uh, we'll have a break at 10.30 for 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll be back for the next four. Uh, buckets of barriers with Dave Curro uh, moderating, and then maybe 15 minutes for a wrap up. 
Okay, so some key terms. Um, I think everybody here knows the basics, you know, IED, whatever, the HHS. But you may not be familiar with CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Service. Um, that uh, there's probably only two people that have a name attached to CMS. That would be John Nashina or might know somebody there, and uh, Tara Heasley from NC Medicaid. Uh, otherwise, it's a completely invisible but godlike entity down in Atlanta. <laughs> it's a federal agency, and they dictate a whole heck of a lot to the state, which then tells us what we can and can't do. Um, the other one, the other term, which hopefully you're familiar with, is Olmstead, the Olmstead decision. Uh, that was a court decision 25 years ago that, I'm not a lawyer, but I believe it really addressed desegregating disability housing. And again, just from a parent perspective, I summarize uh, its decision as mandating choice, control, community. I think those are the key words. Now, let me give you some context to our discussion here. I'll give you a, a first a, a data point. Uh, I'm going to look at just the working age population. And I do that because I'm not looking at the kids in school, and I'm not looking at the adults. That would include people with, um, you know, like me, maybe getting dementia. So we're just looking at the working age population. 5% of North Carolinians of working age have a cognitive disability, cognitive impairment, they call it. That works out to over 300,000 North Carolinians just in that working age group. Um, and that works out, uh, it's probably a, still a broad definition. So I'll be generous to say, okay, let's take it down to 200,000 North Carolinians. And that would be two years ago. 85% of them with an intellectual disability will have just a mild intellectual disability. Those are the folks who are most likely to be self-advocates and be able to transition into the community problem. Um, but that still leaves 20,000 um, who cannot read and understand a lease that they're supposed to be signing with their landlord, which is an Olmstead metric or a state metric. Um, and of those 200,000, about 80% eight, 80 have the kids grown kids still at home with um, them. And we are, the reason for that is that we are the baby boomer generation, very big bulge, and um, we were the first to not institutionalize our babies. They grew up with us and they stayed with us. Um, and now we're gonna start our big life size and what's gonna happen to their children. Okay, now the other thing I need to say is that Discussing housing is, is useless without the FD. Um, we know that, but we need to skate to where the hockey puck's going to be. We can't wait to settle the DSP problem to start talking about housing. Um, okay, so you say, well, there's lots of affordable housing, but um, actually, virtually none of it is targeted to IDD. Uh, if you look at it, uh, IDD is unique in a number of aspects. There's a lot of need for wheelchair accessibility, uh, social network support, and our kids tend to be really noisy. There are other unique factors to that other aspect. Um, so what in the way of affordable housing? Well, if you know the usual nonprofit affordable housing developer gets some grant or loan or something, a tax break of some kind from the government, and when they do, you get conditions set. Uh, upon them, and they must leave uh, 10 to 20 percent of units assigned for disabilities, but that's all disabilities, not IDD. So, in a typical, say, 100 unit development, 20 would be for disabilities, so maybe IDD might get one or two. You're not reaching scale very fast. Um, a lot of them are also built for people earning above 40 percent of the average median area median income. Our kids who are those who are on SSI or SSDI are not going to be able to handle that. And um, you might say, well, there's public housing, but I would say, seriously? Um, 
but there's also a huge wait list for public health. Uh, there's also a lot of vouchers, but those are scarce, uh, difficult to get, and landlords tend not to like vouchers anything. There are HUD group homes. We've got um, we're, the Art of North Carolina is the biggest single pro uh, provider of affordable, any kind of affordable housing in our state. And they serve, I don't know, maybe 1,500 people with IBD. So let's throw in all the other group homes that are out there, even private pay. And maybe you're talking about 3,000 people with IBD. Again, remember, the pool is 200,000 adults, just the working age. Um, you could say, well, let's build a bunch of new group homes. But CMS has mandated, not mandated, that you can have no more than four beds in a group home. And basically, that's financially unsustainable. Um, and there are also limits that Laura can talk to later um, to zoning that you can't have a group home close to another. Carol, yeah. we're having a little um, comments that they're having a hard time hearing. Oh, but if we um, the microphones can actually pick you up, so you don't need to use this one. Oh. I can turn this back on. Sorry, okay. everybody online. Maybe, maybe they can hear better. All right, I stand next to that. Oh. Okay, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you can hear me better. Uh, don't worry, everything will end up in a white paper, so you'll be able to catch up. Thank you. They said better. Good. Thank you. Um, so what we need here is, in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., a fierce urgency. Uh, we have that among parents, and I'm just lumping you with parents. And D, I know you're a special ed teacher, but you know, it's grassroots. Um, we do have fierce urgency among the people most affected by IDD, but we don't necessarily see it in the wider system. Um, they've got the whole system as a whole has a lot of balls to juggle, and IDD is not one of them. So therefore, we have a scads of parents all over the state who are proposing to build group homes and apartment complexes that are one of four things: one, a single group home, but perpetual fundraising to support it; two, a mixed ability large development but resulting in relatively few units for IDD. Three, a cluster of IDD homes or apartments to achieve scale, cost efficiency, and socialization, which meet the spirit of Olmstead, but runs into direct conflict with the letter as interpreted of, of, uh, of Olmstead. And then the fourth option is the scariest, which is private pay. I think a lot of the current parent efforts could easily give up and just to say, okay, we'll do private pay. It costs thousands of dollars a month and only the wealthy North Carolinians will be able to afford it. And we'll get a flood of people from New York or Jersey coming in because this is a great place to retire and they can afford to put their kids in the private pay. So to sum up, uh, before we begin, we see innovation colliding with a rigid and siloed system that really only big bucks can address, uh, big buck entities can address. And we have a, we do have a state strategic plan for housing, uh, for disability housing, which is mandated to meet, to meet the, um, the mandate of Olmstead. But if you really honestly look at it, it does not move the needle on IDD. Um, it, it's a great, effort, lots of people involved from all over, but it really does not focus at all on IDD. So let me just leave you with the image. You have this great aircraft carrier drifting in the ocean. You have the state strategic plan uh, called the Housing Leadership Committee that's producing it as a tugboat trying to push it in the right direction and bring it into port. But on board that aircraft carrier, are some critically ill patients who need to be met of that. So we need to bring in the choppers, bring in the motorized lifeboats and bring them to port now. Um, and we won't, uh, the strategic plans won't be able to do much in less than 10 years or accomplish the goals in less than 10 years. Um, but we can do some quick things I think now um, that will let at least these independent efforts move ahead. And we aren't at least yet asking for big state dollars. 
because uh, we're being realistic. Okay, with that, let me just quickly introduce the panelists. Um, we have Dave Curl, uh, Chair of Wake County. His project is uh, Midtown Housing Coalition. It's in Durham County. It's 20 to 24 tiny homes, which are leased and uh, the land leased and purchased from a, a church. Uh, significant fundraising needed just to start. It will be for mixed disabilities, so not IDD only. Um, Laura Wells with Hope, Hope NC, uh, looking now at the triangle to build um, a intergenerational housing complex with a community engagement facilitator, which is very interesting and unique and wonderful. We have Adam Barnes and Neil Sharp back there somewhere. Yeah. Um, who are trying to develop Peace Haven Farm. And they're in Guilford County. Uh, they already have a house there, but they, they're planning on um, multiple units on a large rural acreage. And it's focused on social engagement and employment via a working farm and spin off businesses either on or off site. Uh, Jeff Holland. <laughs> Um, he's, his project is called My Forever Home. Uh, he's in Johnston County. Uh, it'll be 10 houses on 10 adjacent lots, adjacent lots, supposed to be another, um, in a large new neighborhood, and he's calling it a community within a community. Then we have Eric and Barbara Levin, uh, who are uh, trying to expand what they've got. Uh, it's called G House. And they are in Orange County. Uh, they are aiming for three to four more houses on a seven acre lot uh, close into Chapel Hill, I think within town limits. Yeah. Um, and each of those homes would have three residents with IDD, two live in caregivers, and then they're also supported by DSPs that they've written with. Margaret, Gra Margaret Gaffney of uh, Charlotte, uh, Mecklenburg County. Uh, could not join us today. She texted me. She was very ill. Um, but she, her project is called Indie Tree. And essentially, it's an apartment building complex um, built on the property of and adjacent to a retirement community with a focus being on much interaction. Um, then we have Laura Steve Lorino uh, of Marsh, North Carolina, which just opened their first house in Durham County. Single home with, I guess, four? It is It is now renovated. It's not officially open yet. Oh, okay. We'll provide housing for four individuals with IDD and two women assistants. Right. Um, and then there will be volunteers, all operating as family. Uh, first of more to come, we hope. Yes. Um, and then we have Dee Marsh online. There she is. Hi, Dee. Um, her concept, her project is called Amongst Friends also in Mecklenburg County. Uh, and as she explained it to me uh, currently, it's envisioned as a cluster of dorm-like units built like a college quad for young adults, probably with mild IDD, um, emphasizing fun, freedom, independence. She's a special ed teacher in high school, and a lot of the kids want to stay together as they leave. <laughs> um, and it's their social bond. So those are the the, um, the panelists, and um, I'll get probably doing on time. Okay, my timekeeper over there. Okay, we can start off with a new fifteen minute segment. So Carol Bruce yeah. Allen is joining us from that. Racine Allen. Oh, Racine. Oh, you're just saying she joined her. Yep. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Racine. So our first uh, bucket of barriers is pretty big, time and costs. Uh, it takes years of trial and error to understand the system and the players, then both change within a year, two years, four years. So you're always running to catch up. And the new staff, new legislators may not get IDD and for no party is IDD a priority. So um, everyone here with the panel, um, if we could just start by 
naming what poops and buffs uh, you've been experiencing in your efforts. Um, um, just to go ahead and name them, to give all of us an idea of the many, many, many different things you're running into. And because everybody's shy, I'm going to start with Dave. <laughs> He's not. <laughs> uh, what does it cost you in time and money? Uh, in been partly been uh, almost three years now, coming up on three years, and to get North Carolina Housing Finance Agency money, you have to be in business for three years. So you're starting off as a minimum of three years if you're nonprofit. So I'm 67 years old. Three years is a long time for me. So um, not only that, but you know, time is money, and to get this started, it's you have to ask for grants and stuff. And fortunately, um, to be able to do our nonprofit, we got a grant from the church. Um, and most of the funding, though, comes out of my back pocket to get this going. Um, once we did start doing a little fundraising, you know, I did a couple of. You know, People donated because I guess they thought I was nuts. Um, but it just, it, it's, I like to think of it as a 10,000 piece puzzle. And every once in a while, you get to put a piece in. And, you know, as we, we go along, you know, coming up on the three year thing at a minimum for your nonprofit, um, you just don't have enough pieces of the puzzle to put in yet. To make this happen. Now I know some projects have been going for 10 years and they haven't moved in yet. So. And Laura Hope started out uh, with three moms, what, three or four years ago? Six. Six years ago. <laughs> um, frankly, two of them have now left the state out of despair. Mm -hmm. um, but Hope has stayed and is pivoting and looking again. What sorts of barriers did they run into and are you running into? I think the the for a long time it was the pair of finding a developer who would be willing to develop um, such a project of having um, an apartment or housing complex where 20% of the units are set aside for adults with IDD and the rest are a mixture of older adults, individuals, and families. And so once we found a developer who an affordable housing developer who was willing to do it. It was the the difficulty of finding land, which has taken several years because when you find land, if it's affordable, it's typically not next to public transit. And most of the people with IDD and older adults, a lot of them are not going to drive. And we don't want people to be given this great opportunity to live in their own apartment and then be stuck isolated because they can't get anywhere. So close to transit means that land, particularly in the triangle, but across North Carolina is very expensive. And um, when you add in that cost, then the affordable housing developer can't make the numbers pencil out because for it to, you know, be to keep the cost down. The other thing I think you mentioned is that people with IDD typically make less than 30% of the area media income. So the rents have to be extremely low for them. And in order to do that, you can't spend millions and you know millions of dollars buying land only then to the cost to develop it. So that's what set Hope NC back um, for quite a while. And I guess we'll get to funding in a minute because you've got some more, I know, to yeah. add to that. Um, I guess I'll turn to Laura next. Sure. Um, for just, I would say, immediate hoops to jump through that uh, come to mind. The um, idea of the large chair model is something that is, uh, an, it's an international federation. There's over 150 large communities around the world. There are 17 established large communities in the United States in each community. It's a community of communities um, from two to 16 homes of, of large communities. The model of large is that we have folks live in um, this house that are providing care and support. So some of our DSPs will live at the house, some will live outside of the house. This care model um, in other states where LARSH is established is seen as the premier model. Um, there are other large communities, Erie, Pennsylvania, um, 
Cleveland, Ohio, who in their notes uh, from their state uh, review have that it is the premier model and they want more LARSH. Here in, the, here in the state of North Carolina, there has yet to be a licensed uh, LARSH home. I'm um, hoping that, that will come in the next month, two months, uh, as we just finished the renovations. But a year ago, um, after expecting to have live-in assistance, I was on a call with DHHS and I was explaining uh, this care model and the person who we spoke to said, oh, live-in assistance, you can't have people live there. You can't have a toothbrush. They can't keep a toothbrush at the house. And I said, well, 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 what, what? They, they have to have a toothbrush. They're living there. This is their mailing address. And they said, well, that's alternative family living. So now we have to be licensed as an AFL, which is limited to three people with IDD. And again, the problem with this is that that is not a written law or policy. It is an expectation or an interpretation that if you have live-in, that it's an AFL, but it's not written anywhere. So the jump and the hurdle for um, our organization is sometimes it depends on who you talk to to get the information. And sometimes you talk to one person and you get different information than when you talk to the first person. And so it's just, it's been really challenging to sort this out um, because it's never been done here. And uh, especially since it's been seen as successful in other places that we have to wiggle around. And then once we do have our first three people live at the house then we have to apply for a waiver. And that is part of our funding plan to have four people who live there. It's a beautiful six bedroom house. and. We should be able to have four people um, live in that space, especially since you've already named that uh, you can have four beds in a group home. Um, yep. Um, I just got a note saying not everybody knows what a DSP is. Ah, That's okay. a direct support professional. So it's the people who provide services to IDD. Um, I'm going to turn to Eric next. Yeah. A little short, but. What's your reaction to what Laura? Yeah, said? thank you, Laura. Yeah, thank you, Carol. You know, just thank you for everyone being here. I mean, we need to build more inventory. First of all, like everyone that this is evolution, and you know, because there's no standards, there's a lot of different models, and that's good. I mean, so you know, but we have to push through, and you know, you you did the math, and and that's my motto: love and math. Okay, I mean, everything else is, you know, I'm sorry to say BS, you know, so it's, I mean, obviously logic and law is, is important, but love is, is what drives us for our children, right? And, but obviously the mathematics needs to work. So our model is, and I'm going to read just because, well, no, just, just my lawyer's response to what we are, okay? The G House provides a residential community for people with disabilities, but is not a family care home or other adult care home under North Carolina law. The G House does not provide support or supervisory personnel or personal care or habilitation services. It is not regulated by the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Okay, so <laughs> I just had to get that out there because, you know, we are not a group home. We are just a rental property. Thank you. Be back, uh, Adam. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All that. <laughs> how much time and how much it costs? Because you've got some paid consultants, right? We do. Uh, we've been working with a consulting firm for a little over a year now, trying to figure all this out. Uh, East Haven, our first home was built in 2014, um, so it's been a while. Uh, but as we look forward to moving uh, and developing more housing and more opportunities, uh, trying to figure out what makes the most sense for us, uh, just kind of complicated. Um, you know, talking about love, uh, I don't think a lot of us are like naturally ingrained in policy uh, in some of these systems. <laughs> and so uh, the learning curve is a bit steep, just trying to figure out uh, what's the right service and what's the right definition for this that we're trying to work with. Um, it's been complicated, but um, certainly consultants have been helpful. Uh, and there's a level of privilege that we have to be able to make that happen. Do you have a price tag on the consultant spending so far? Uh, I'll defer to the nail. Yeah. Do you have a price tag? Uh, a, a rough price tag that we have spent was probably around fifty thousand so, dollars. Yeah, not not cheap. And you have to put a spade in the ground. On on the next page. That's right. correct. <laughs> Jeff. I want to first say I'm very grateful for Laura uh, 
and and for the coalition that she's put together, weaving us together, because you have now a way to figure out. I don't know this, but has somebody else already gone through this? That has been monumental. Um, several things that we're facing or that we've dealt with. Are we is this with the time and the cost? Yes. This, okay. With time, we were thinking, what kind of model can we put together that we don't spend years and years and years just bringing into being? Um, that that part is something we've been trying to develop here. I'm kind of like Dave. I'm just nipping at his heels with age. Um, he was calling his age out. I thought, I don't have a decade or two to try to put all this together. I, I, what can we do and do it within just a few years? Um, so uh, that is one thing on the time is sometimes how long these projects take just to bring it into existence for 10 to 20 people. Um, the cost, then for us, we were given 10 lots you know, by a developer. So those were each 120,000 each if we had tried to pay for those. Um, the, the builder said he would do it for 160,000 each for the homes. And so that just gives you a rough idea of just trying to bring ours into existence, what the cost would have been. I'm guessing you know, a million dollars or whatever. Um, one last comment, Dave. Yeah, I just wanted to mention too, I, I had an estimate to build out our project was $3.6 million. And that's excluding the land. You had one other estimate that I was struck by eighty thousand dollars just to apply for a chance at HFA grant. Um, right. Because you'd have to pay lawyers and consultants to write. So yeah, it real quick. We met with uh the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency in May, and they were great. I mean, very, very helpful. What I found was the regulations were burdensome. So by the time we went through all the requirements that we had to have, um, my grant writer figured it would cost us eighty thousand dollars just to apply, and then it's less than a 50-50 chance that we would get it. And you don't get your money back. Can I get sure one quick yeah, number? Okay. Uh, and I know this is about cost. So um, earlier you named the need for philanthropy. We will forever be reliant upon philanthropy. Um, for the staff for our house, uh, it will be with staff benefits, uh, taxes, $269,016 next year. And from Medicaid reimbursement per diem and uh, room and board, it, it, we will bring in $260,423. That is not paying our mortgage, our utilities, our food, et cetera just the staff alone and paying them a wage to recruit and retain in the CSP uh, direct support professionals crisis. So we're already $9,000 short just by paying people. Okay. I'm learning stuff too. How are we doing time? Oh, we have another yeah, question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll take time for that. Comment and a question. All right. Uh, comment from Lori. Um, I don't know which Lori, but anyway. Um, go get Hogan. Go get Oh, go get Okay. Uh, we operate 18 living group homes. So that statement that you heard from DHHS, not true. I think she was referring to yours. Um, Mike, please explain the details, if available, of specific wording problems uh, problematic to Olmstead Act as it pertains to clusters of homes. Uh, as mentioned in the opening, we'll try to do that. Um, I can't do that here. Um, I think that we're all trying to figure out that answer, uh, which is part of the reason we're here today. Um, okay, moving on to the second barrier. Great question, Mike. Um, Olmstead, let's go to it. Olmstead, um, the quote unquote settings rule prohibits congregate living. And I'm not positive those are the two words Olmstead usually for any disability. So again, Olmstead isn't just about IDD. Um, yeah. the, uh, my position is these parents are definitely meeting the spirit of the intent that the judge in that Olmstead decision meant. But they are, as interpreted, meeting the letter of the law. So uh, NC Medicaid, and everyone's well-intentioned, CMS, NC Medicaid, everyone here is well-intentioned, 
but we may be so silent in the structure, we need help breaking up. Anyway, anti-Medicaid and CMS are kind of like a sort of Damocles hovering over these people who've already made significant investments of money. Could be for not. Um, and you need apparently a written clearance, letter back from CMS itself about your specific thing, like building on retirement home property. Um, so we need clar clarification, flexibility, forgiveness, and a quick no. It's not going to go. Um, so talk a little bit about Olmstead. I don't know. I'll turn to Laura first. Um, well, you know, Olmstead says that people have the right to live in the community as um, with the least restrictions possible. And so what um, has been unclear to us in working to create um, those environments. So like I said, if you have like 100 apartment complexes and, you know, what is the what is the right number um, within that that meets the letter of that law? So is it 20%? Is it 25%? And then when you look at the, so there's lots of different places you get, um, and John Nash has talked about this in our collective impact work, you know, you get one answer from HUD about if you get HUD money, what's that right percentage? And then there's the home and community-based settings rule, which is part of Medicaid, that does, we've scoured the rules and HCBS to see where does it say, where does it spell out what that percentage is, and it doesn't say. Um, very clearly, if it, if it says it anywhere that I've found. So um, for us, you know, we hope was founded with this belief, the, the parents that um, founded hope that it should look like it looks like everywhere else. Like if one in four people have a disability, just in general in the world, that when you have a setting, you want it to look much like that. You know, you don't want the cluster of people what we've found is like a developer will say, well, I'll build that for you. And then you can put all your people on the first floor or, you know, one developer wanted to give us like this one acre of land on the rest of this um, five acre property. And you can build your apartments for your people on that one acre. And then we'll have the people without disabilities over here. Well, that is not Olmstead. That is stigmatizing. I don't think people realize they think, oh, people are fine with that. That's fine. But what happens then is the people on this property walking by that one acre are like, oh, the people that live there. And, you know, or if they're all in the apartment building, they're like, oh, the people on that floor, let's not go on that floor. You know, and that's not what we want. What we want is people to get to know each other because when you know people one-on-one, -on -one, it's very different than when you see a group of people that you think are other. When you get to know people one-on-one, -on -one, you realize, you're just like me, your weaknesses and my weaknesses may be different, your strengths and my strengths may be different, but we are both the same, so some of that is. Thank you, Laura, that's really eloquent. Um, Let me, can I yeah, go ahead, next yeah. on this one? We have an instant thing that's just the opposite of what she's describing. And I think what she has described is beautiful. I, but I, on the other side, we were given 10 lots. Our 10 lots are side by side. It, but I don't think the spirit was there for what I heard some were describing for some viewers. We were just given 10 lots. And so we had to go and clear and say, can our 10 people live beside each other in a neighborhood? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, well, why can't they? You know, I can go pick in any home I want to go live in. You know, why can't? you know, somebody with IDD live next door to somebody with IDD. Yeah. And so we had to go and clear this. Um, and we think we've gotten it cleared that yes, we're going to develop a community within the neighborhood so that there is relationship among the 10 people who live side by side while they're developing relationship in the neighborhood too. So um, it's this idea of well, if somebody with IDD moves into a neighborhood, must they move in beside somebody without IDD? You know, so we've had to wrestle with this a little bit and thinking, can we help develop community among the 10 residents in the larger community as they have access there? So we struggled with whether Medicaid would support that or not. Um, so it's slight variation on what Laura's saying, but Here's another instant twist to it. You know, can people with IDD live beside anybody they want to live beside? 
great question. I should add that the Sword of Damocles, I should have explained the reason why it's the Sword of Damocles is that if <laughs> somebody rules that it's not compliant with Olmstead, the residents lose their waiver. That's a pretty big one. Yeah. Well, I just uh, want to thank you, Joe, um, you know, always. Um, but I, I wanted Barbara to introduce Barbara. Um, she's my partner. <laughs> she has a lot of information, that I, I feel, about this category as it relates. In, in it. She's an educator. So. Um, just briefly, Carol, when you spoke at the beginning about Olmstead, you mentioned choice, control, and community. That resonates with me a lot. Um, we've been living in this experiment for 11 months experiment at the G House. Um, I'm a career public educator. I understand that people in preschool might start with an IFSP, an individual family support plan. They go to public education, they have an IEP, an individual uh, individualized education plan. If they're in adopted curriculum or something, they might they might stay in high school until they're 22 or seven done and graduated with a diploma when they're 19. But then there's the cliff. And if you're sitting in this room and you're a parent, you know that then the cliff is as someone described to me recently is summer forever. It's summer forever. And she said that to me last week because her son graduated from Parkville High School. And that really resonated with me as well. Once you hit the cliff, if you don't have the waiver, our son is fortunate enough to have had the waiver since he was three years old and in the state of North Carolina. Life saving, amazing. I think all people should have it. You might have really good intention to right. I think when it comes to Olmstead, and I, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> I'm a human being, these are all human beings, but if the spirit of it is choice, and control and community. And if people choose to live in a place, they should be allowed to live in a place. And I keep coming back to that. And when we live in the public education world, we provide the use restrictive environment and we provide accommodations to help people get what they need. And then they hit the cliff. And then we say, thanks to Olmstead and other things, you need to go out in the community and live in the community. With what? And how, and without choice, and if you don't have the waiver, you are a few steps away. Thank goodness we have a level one emergency room at the UNC hospital. If Eric and I die tomorrow, we have some supports in place, but our son is so disabled that we're not too many steps away from that. So it's our imperative that we have to do what we're doing, and someone can come to our house and tell us that we can't do it, but this is for our, the waiver has saved us, and having people around us the DSPs, engaging with other people, is life-saving. It makes all the difference. Thank you. And I want to take a moment. Is Holly here? Holly Riddle? <laughs> Holly Price? Where are you? <laughs> um, do you have anything to say? You're, you're like the Olmstead guru. Well, hi, folks. Holly Riddle, the HHS uh, Secretary in the Olmstead Secretary. First of all, the important thing is that Olmstead is silent on the subject of housing. I think Laura really put it well, uh, as did you, that Olmstead gives people uh, a right to be in the community or not, or not. And it doesn't say anything about how that's supposed to be funded. It certainly doesn't say anything about housing or transportation or anything. They want you close to the house. Close to the house, that's people. Um, but, and also Olmstead is not uh, an act. It's a United States Supreme Court decision. Uh, I'm so glad that Lisa and Kelly, other lawyers are in here. I know that's a fine distinction, but it's important. What it means is that over time, because the Supreme Court has made a very important policy decision, that cases will evolve across the United States in different jurisdictions that will articulate what Olmstead means. I wondered if I might ask a real lawyer, <laughs> if the brass does she like to add anything to that? Um, if you do, please come up sure. to yeah. the speaker. Just briefly, I mean, I, I, I will agree with Holly that, um, you know, Olmstead and the and the HCBS rules are two different things, and certainly the HCBS rules have kind of evolved out of where Olmstead came from. Olmstead actually involved two women who were institutionalized in a facility in Georgia, and they wanted to live in the community. They were in it was a psychiatric hospital, so it's it that's the, that's the start of it. Olmstead truly doesn't say anything about you know about whether people can have ten homes next to each other. That's a funding question, and 
and I gather that the issue that people are raising is the home and community based services rule settings rule um, and how that applies. It, it it was not my understanding that that it did preclude that kind of um, arrangement, but I do think it's important for us to separate those two issues because I think um, it confuses mm -hmm. things in the broader community when we say Olmstead is a barrier to things mm -hmm. because Olmstead did nothing but good in my opinion <laughs> because it is about choice. Um, so. All that's to say, I, I think sometimes the bureaucracy and, and sometimes rules don't necessarily uh, anticipate, but it really just comes down to who's going to pay. And I think that's the broader question here. And it certainly makes sense to me that um, that you're going to have support for a model that clearly looks um, like a good model for folks, but also understanding that from the bureaucratic point of view, which, and not to use bureaucratic in a negative way, there has to be a rule, right, that works. And a lot of things that come out really tend to need to be exceptions because they may, they look like a good model, but in the wrong hands, they're not a good model, right? These are the good hands right here, but not everybody's uh, a good actor in this space. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Um, Talent, do you want to come up? Yeah, so um, I, I encourage you, I, um, when I was at Atlanta Legal Aid, which did the Olmstead case um, and, and really got to, my mentor was Sue Jamison, who was the Olmstead attorney. Um, we developed a, a website called OlmsteadRights.org, and I'd encourage you to go to OlmsteadRights.org and read the history of Olmstead. It has been deeply concerning to me that um, that there is this sort of anger and frustration with with the Olmsted decision that comes out in meetings like this, and I understand it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we do need to really understand where we were. And what Olmstead stands for. And um, so Lois was in a psychiatric hospital that I used to visit all the time. She was locked in. I had to go through two locked doors to get into that space to meet with my clients. And um, Lois um, called Sue and said, get me out of here. And that was her request for legal services. Um, she had a developmental disabilities, but was in the mental health psychiatric ward. And um, and they said, well, because you are in the psychiatric ward, you don't qualify for what was called uh, the now comp waiver, which is the same as the innovations waiver here. Um, you know, if you were in the developmental disability side, even though you have a developmental disability, we could get you there. Um, and so she was forced to stay in this institution. That was her only home. Ultimately, Elaine came in. She went to school um, in Augusta in a psychiatric hospital from the age of 14. She could never get out of there. And the only place that she they had to live was this locked psychiatric hospital. And um, what was amazing about that case was it went to the Northern District of Georgia, the 11th Circuit, two very conservative courts, and they ruled in favor of Lois and Elaine. And then it went up to the Supremes. And when it went to the Supremes, the only way, reason it got selected was because the Supreme Court was going to overturn the 11th Circuit and rule against Lois and Elaine. And the argument was it was going to cost too much money. And ultimately, uh, people with disabilities rose up. And they went to their attorneys general. Most of the attorneys generals and governors were in favor of Georgia's position that this was going to cost too much money. But people with disabilities all went to their AGs and said, this is wrong. This is discrimination. This is killing these people. We have got to give them the right to live in the community. And many of those attorney generals switched sides. And by the time the, the court decided the case, most of the states had actually turned against Georgia and said, we need to favor this for people to have the right to live in the community. And so ultimately this new act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the US Supreme Court ruled in favor of Lois and Elaine and said, they have the right, it is a reasonable accommodation to say that the money that the state of Georgia is paying for them to live in a psychiatric hospital has to go to live in the community and they have the right to live in the community. And so now we continue to live in a time where there is simply not enough money. And one of the things that I really struggle with is the word choice, because people do not have a choice. Spencer, who was on that cliff, who graduated from high school in Charlotte, has nothing. He is on the waiting list. He will stay on the waiting list. And so um, he does not have a choice. And so if your choice is to go into an ICF where you may or may not want, and I've been to Carol Sun's ICF, and it seems like a, a fine place, but if your choice is to either go into that setting, which is a 
group home um, or nothing, that is not a choice. And so um, right now we simply don't have that choice in the state of North Carolina. Um, I love this discussion. I don't think we really sowed the ground well enough for Samantha R when it came out. For us, we needed to have these discussions here to really talk about the challenge between safety and um, independence. And right now we don't have a choice between safety and independence. Thank That's you. Great. Thank you, Tally. And and my bad, because I didn't know the distinction between Homestead and Home and Community Upstairs. Thank you. I have a, a comment and a possible solution to all this for us, right? Because we're looking at facing you know, the bureaucracy and the rules, regulations. Is there a place that we can go to present our, our project and get a yes or a no from North Carolina mm -hmm. where we can do our project. And if there's not, I'd like to mm -hmm. see one because I want a definitive answer whether my project is legal or not based on North Carolina law. That's a great thing to put down as a solution. Just a 20 second. If you want more information and uh, to listen to Tally tell that story and more and to get that to more people, Hidden Voices is a podcast wherever you get your podcasts from uh, Larsh, uh, Atlanta, and um, others in Georgia. It was a storytelling project, Hidden Voices. It's got a, the outline of the state of Georgia, and there's two seasons of it. The first episode talks about Homestead, and it, it is a great way for anybody who is unfamiliar with all IDD joys and challenges to be more informed. So all legislators if, and non-knowing uh, folks, listen to this podcast, really. Thank you. Okay, I will look to, yeah. just a real quick one. There's Grandview Housing and Services. Uh, up, up to the mic, I think. Up to the mic, Holly. <laughs> um, and then we need to move on to the next Sorry. one. There is, there's a brand new Housing and <laughs> Services Resource Center uh, that has just opened up. I'll send the website to uh, one of you. Uh, there, th it's evident that at the federal level, our, our federal partners are trying to bridge this gap between housing and services. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Holly. Yeah, um, all right, next, well, well, it's kind of the same thing, but some legal, the next bucket are legal questions. <laughs> um, it's about the regulations and reporting requirements um, that are many. They aren't coordinated with each other. You know, each layer is going to have their own reporting requirement and application process. Uh, and legal advice is very expensive. Um, and probably just relying on collaboration with large nonprofits and private developers has its drawbacks too, because IDD is not going to be their priority. They may not get IDD. Um, so the system wasn't really set up for innovation or novice efforts. Um, and there's a point system that punishes new people or awards the old. Um, I don't know, Adam, Adam Neal, do you have any comments about the regulations and, and reporting requirements and application process? Um. Very common because it's a very structured. Um, I don't know, it's kind of it's really complicated system. Um, figuring out kind of who to report to, what all you have to report. Um, accreditation somewhere in the mix. Um, all the different things you really um, get kind of that steep learning curve. Learning curve coming at this from a place of love and priority system. So it's just really complicated. So that you had anything else you wanted to add? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll just share on, on top of that. I mean, it is it's it's hard to be innovative in this uh, in this process. But I'll speak for myself and say that for me, there has been a lot of support uh, that we've found from from the different agencies. There 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 is a hope and a and a, a wave of change. It feels that that there there's a desire for innovation. There's a desire for change. Uh, we've heard from legislators that uh, tell us the red tape that needs to be moved. Um, you know, and I think that's that's a really difficult thing because we're trying to figure out where the red tape is too. Uh, and 
CMS, DHHS, the LMEs all have their own understanding of the red tape, but they don't necessarily always know the other side of the red tape. <laughs> you know, even the experts uh, are are learning in this process too. And I think um, the the hope is that we we can all share in these in these uh, these forums and venues what what those innovative approaches that we're having, the conversations that are working. Um, but it is it's incredibly complex, uh, and so. I, I don't know the, the answer to that, but I but I do feel that there is a generative spirit about um, about things right now, and, and hopefully that the, the winds of change are going to continue to blow in a in a positive direction. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, um, Laura. What tell us about your licensing experience? Well, I've already mentioned uh, the one of a quick switch of having to go to AFL, and I appreciate uh, Lori Gogan uh, uh, being on the call and um, making that comment. I just want to clarify that you can't, from our understanding, and this points back to the challenges, from our understanding, you can have a live-in for seven days on, seven days off. But we want that home to be a place where our live-in assistants call it home and they're not leaving for seven days. Um, our uh, licensing process has been uh, quite the journey. Um, also, just learning all of the different language uh, that um, each entity uses. So some call it... Um, cities and counties and DHHS and um, uh, the LME MCOs all have different terms for, sometimes for the exact same thing. Is it supportive assisted living? Is it a family care home? Is it a group home? Um, all, is So I think part of the issue is we don't know what we're calling different things or we're calling the same thing the different things um, in different areas. Um, our uh, experience, if you ever want to license a home for uh, your loved one or get in uh, this work, um, first your initial application, and then you have to have, of course, sanitation and fire marshals come into the space. Um, we had to have that after our renovations were done because it wasn't, we had ceilings open with um, removing asbestos. After we have uh, sanitation approval and fire marshal, then we'll have an on-site uh, inspection, um, our licensing and policies, our, our policies and procedures will be um, sent in and approved, hopefully, um, of course. And uh, then we have, I believe, another visit to the house um, that it's all set up and ready to go. And so there's just so many different players uh, that are we're keeping track of, of, okay, we need to have this person over. It is um, not for... Uh, I don't know the the cliche uh, the the part. yeah exactly um, <laughs> how much how much did the license cost you uh, uh, the applicant do was there a fee for to apply it's, it's based on the number of beds and it's been a while since I sent that in it was in the two hundreds I believe or maybe three hundred per bed um, no per oh, oh. per per house per house okay and that well there's initial application and then there's the construction review fee. And I don't know if we if there's other fees involved. So it's it's not a lot, but if we we'd have to I believe keep paying that if the first time um, if we don't go through. Okay, um, I did have a chance to talk with uh, Representative uh, Sarah Crawford, um, and she was saying that the licensing process she runs an ICF, but this would be for any licensed facility, is very long, and because you need consultants or lawyers or something, it can also be really expensive. I, we have a pro bono lawyer team, and I will say that just this year, um, if we were paying for it out of pocket, it's over $42,000 to help us navigate um, the end of this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. See Eric over there. Yeah. Well, thank you, Laura. Uh, you, you know, I just, we, we met early on with Scott Keller with RSI, and he was, we were considering, you know, actually uh, becoming a group home, and he was like, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> and so we, we took that advice to heart and we're like, you know, he's like, just stay a private model. And, you know, that that is consistent with with Barbara and the school system and, and all of that is there's no need for this, you know, this combined. There are two buckets. There's housing and then there's healthcare, And both of those are, are separate. You know, and there's choice in the middle, and and those are the two buckets, and they they are separate buckets. I mean, we have the waiver. Each person has. I mean, Barbara can go through. You know, our people have have one has a waiver, one has 1915I, one has cap DA, and they all manage their own own care. You know, it's choice, 
And, you know, it's the housing, I, I, I mean, to me is, I've been discovered the section eight HCV rates and to me, that's, uh, I mean, that is this, the gold standard and is that these individuals should, by right, receive the HCV as well as, as health care. I mean, they're, you know, born with a disability and they're born into poverty and, you know, they're one step away from the emergency room. So, you know, it's the, if you're going to give them choice, give them the home choice voucher so they can pay for housing wherever they want to, and give them the waiver and they can get support however they want to. And the acronym... The acronym you're using, uh, HCV. Is Home Choice Voucher, Section 8. It's a federal program, and it, it should be a, uh, they should be given this right. That's going to be a federal yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, just like what everyone's talking about, the, the, I look at it. I look at it. Health care is a separate issue from housing. Because if someone moves into a housing and then they decide to leave, their health care should go with them, I think. Yeah. So to me, it's a separate thing. And then uh, just supporting housing development programs from North Carolina Housing Finance Agency says that you need to have support, uh, health care support. So that's another issue that I really don't want to deal with because it's above my head, right? I'm not a doctor in, in any of that. So that's just one of the, the rules that I think it, it probably should be eliminated. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm looking at some of the other things to develop a, a housing program. And you know, we're talking about legal morass and clarity and all that. I'm looking at, at this 23 page document from the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency supported housing development program. Please don't change your name, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, both rehab is like, I don't. Um, so I'm looking at this going, okay, I've got to have three to five years experience doing this, and I get 10 points. Somebody's got 20 years doing it, gets 50 points. So I'm behind the power curve there. Also, projects not located in the CDVG entitlement areas, which I have no idea what that means, uh, will receive 30 bonus points. And I don't think Durham is in that area. So now I'm behind 70 points on the score. And these are regulations, I'm assuming, from North Carolina. From North Carolina. So some of this has to has to change a little bit. So you know, this group here, the parents and and yeah. folks that don't do this for a living can do this for our kids because we know what our kids want. We know what they can handle. I mean, my son's 37. I kind of got him figured out by now. <laughs> So, and just to yeah. piggyback on that, um, one thing we discovered when because our affordable housing developer was going to use low income housing tax credits to build a community, um, you can't use supportive housing development program if you're using life in a live tech property, right? Low income housing tax property. One or the so other. one or the other, and that for us, you know, we need the supportive housing development program to help make the, the rents for the folks who need the services, the supportive piece, low enough for them to be able to rent it. So that's a big, and other states, I, I our developer told us they're from Massachusetts. They say mm -hmm. uh, Massachusetts does that, they use them. So there's no reason why North Carolina could not use them together. They just choose not to. Right, which is some another solution. Yep. Right, because that's significant money. Um, and just to give you an idea, folks that are on SSI get $946 a month. The average rent in Durham is $1,418 a month. Not including utilities. Not yeah. Including utilities. So the HUD is where it's at. Right? right. The only the people that have the housing choice vouchers are the ones who can do it. Right. And those are so hard to get. And I agree with what Eric said. Like those should be like 
should be like a package deal. If you're going to be able to live in the community and you have your Medicaid waiver, you should be able to get the housing choice voucher. Amen. Nicole uh, from online asked, what is the document Dave is referring to? It's not both rehab. Uh, what is the document? It's North Carolina Housing Finance Authority, right? Yeah, it's North Carolina Housing Finance Agency Supported Housing Development Program. Yeah, if you go on the Housing Finance Agency website and click on Support About. Yeah. Keisha's here with Yes. With Do you have anything? Uh, and, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I will try. Stand up here. Thank you, Keisha. I'm trying to, I don't want to block anybody. It's okay. Uh, but yeah, North Carolina Housing Finance. And we have our supportive housing guidelines. The ones on our website right now are from 2024. That cycle we just awarded yesterday. And we are pleased to announce we've got several projects that, well, one particular project that works with IDB specifically. Um. To comment on tax credits and supportive housing, there is a separation for us because our tax credit developers are so nuanced and so large. We wanted our supportive housing money to be separate, to go to smaller nonprofits, to build anywhere from four to like 15, 16 units or beds, we fund shelters, Group homes, we work with the ARC, HASA, RSI. So we are looking to do that. And we do have a requirement that not the nonprofit be at least three years for their 501c3. The reason that is, is because nonprofits start, they don't all finish. Okay? So when you're talking about giving somebody $1.2, $1.3 million, do you want to give it to somebody who's only been in business for six months? No, that's not fiscally responsible. However, with yours, you're coming up on three years, aren't you? January. <laughs> yeah. And for us, we are open. Anybody that wants to talk about our money, please call us. We will have a separate meeting specifically for you to discuss your specific project and how we can help you, because that's what we're here to do. I guess yeah. off everybody's well-intentioned. I'll just point out that the North Carolina Housing Finance Authority has been really kicked in the tail um, hard by the state legislature. Funding has been cut, cut, cut. Um, they've got other funds, but those things are not getting refreshed. I just want to say our big housing agency yeah. is low on the totem pole. I think another barrier I would name is the timeline piece, not the how long you have to be in business, but the timeline of if someone comes to me and says, I have a house and um, it needs to be renovated and we want to turn that over and create more opportunities because we will have a wait list to live at large. Um, more people are applying them are our four beds. My understanding is you have to first visit that the, the timeline of visiting versus when we can actually start renovations and get approved for funding. If there is a long waiting, a long wait between the visit and the application and when we can start because it's not retroactively funded. So by the time we found out about it, we had already uh, signed a general contractor for our $80,000 worth of renovations. Um, that were privately with donors um, and other foundations, but um, it's it's a challenge to just pinpoint that so perfectly that if there is a way to change that, I would I would love to chat more. Absolutely, but we our process is set up that way for a reason, and that is we have the application where we come in and say, hey, our first step is just to look at the property to see if it's actually viable. And we go see all of them. Anybody that submits a form, there is no cost to submit a project description and site visit form for this money. So there's no cost for that. So we look at it because we've gone to sites where they couldn't find it. They literally were there with a the realtor and could not find which plot of land they wanted us to look at. I mean, but we stayed, we reviewed. That's what we're here to do. Then, and let's see, so our... Our NOFA comes out in October. We do site visits the first or second week in November. And then the applications are due by March. 
The reason that is, is that gives the smaller nonprofits time because a lot of times they don't have their funds all together. They have a general idea and a wish and a hope of what they want to do. So we give them that time to, okay, let's get it all together. And while that's happening, we're still offering technical support. Mm -hmm. Then from there, the March, then we have to go through the whole application procedure. Mm -hmm. That's where we're reviewing it, the underwriting and whatnot. We're still working hand in hand to see how we can get this project to work. The best thing to do is as soon as you have an idea, call us. Sure. As soon as you have the idea that you want to do something, call us and we can say, okay, we're putting you on our radar. We will notify you when this money comes in. Always let us know because you never know when we might have two cycles a year. Mm -hmm. um, Eric. Yeah, well, just in this category of, you know, legal, this bucket of legal questions, and, and thank you, Keisha, for, you know, providing funding, and I, you know, but I think uh, Tim Gallagher back there, I, you know, he, in one of his Weaving Connection seminars or, or symposiums, you know, he, he's like, you know, money just needs to come from wherever, and, you know, you look at the art, the Jacksonville art, 29 acres, Bergen County, United Way, Trailhead Community, First Place, Arizona, Main Street, Connect, when you look at their capital stacks, the price, the cost per person capital wise is anywhere from $181,000 to $335,000 per bedroom. That's consistent with yours. So it's like, but the thing is we, we separate rents from capital and it's in the United States, it's like, I'm a commercial developer, I'm a commercial property owner. The government rents for me. I invested in a property and they pay me rent. It's capital and rent. They're separate. Walmart is does, a private investor owns the, the real estate. It's, you know, it, it has to have appreciation. It's, you know, capital is money. It's green. It's separate. You know, rents, uh, you know, the, you look at the average rents of the art of Jacksonville to Main Street Connect. It's their market rates. They're $1,500 to $1,800. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, we, these are two separate buckets again, capital and rent. They, they're required. I mean, it, we make this so confusing and so many rules on it. Where I, I mean, my question is, you know, just I'm not a nonprofit. I'm, I, you know, we are an LLC. You know, I don't have. We have a, you know, whatever two years of experience as an LLC. But that's the way you you buy real estate. I mean, so it's just an issue of capital. Where can we get the capital? I mean, you know, out there, the CDFI funds are great. The banks are great. But, you know, it's like we need, you know, all these people, we just need to, you know, hey, we need capital. Let's apply for it. You know, it's a loan. It's, a, you know, I got, I got a, a grant. I own this property. I put solar on the, on, on a, a property. I got $100,000 in a federal program, you know, for a solar program. I got uh, the CDFI loan me money, you know, two and a half percent in Tennessee. So, it, you know, it's very simple money. Grants, you know, boom, it makes it happen. It's capital. Okay. Um, yeah, I wish it should be simpler. Yeah. To that, I'm just asking for where is that, you know, transparency and simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but, um, so we know that we need rolling, rolling deadlines, I think. But that's not real. You know, if only then, you know, that's the well, problem. Not up to us <laughs> because their money comes from Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and that was that was my point earlier. Is a lot of these rules and regulations are from the state, and if we can go to the state and say this is not working for parent-driven housing options, how can we change this? You know, and maybe we need some sort of working group with just legislators, with uh, Representative Hawkins and the IDD caucus, or something like that to streamline these regulations and to set up a place where we can go and say, this is our project, help us do this. You know, because I'm just a parent. That sounds I'll like play. we almost need two tracks here. There's kind of your big usual developers and a small parent stuff. But anyway, I'm just throwing that out. But there's some, one of you also told me that you had difficulty getting insurance on the houses. Is that you, Jeff? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, well, we're, we're in, the process right now trying to just get liability insurance. That may be what you yeah. refer to. So my early 
efforts and trying to seek that out haven't been successful so far. So that's the short suite. We're working on that. Okay. We're trying to figure that model out. Okay, so that's a whole other element. East. Good stuff. <laughs> <That's what they're laughs> um, any other comments? I mean, John, we haven't called on you yet. <laughs> To the, to the owl, to that. Yeah. Yes. Where to start? Um, <laughs> as a person who spends an inordinate amount of time looking at not just housing, which I spend a lot of time with housing, I spend a lot of time looking at services, which are two very different things. <laughs> services which are two very different things and you can't have somebody living independently in the community without both and those are two very very different buckets and they are separated out and believe me i have said at the highest levels carol's been with me at hud talking to the senior deputy to the secretary who said, you know what, that's a problem. You're right. You yeah. need to talk to CMS about this. <laughs> and I asked them point blank, cool, would you invite me to that conversation? I was told no. Because CMS does not talk services and, and or HUD does not talk services and CMS does not talk housing. And yet you can't have a person, if we're talking about a whole person, you can't separate the two, right? Those of us that have family members living in a community, you can't, you can't break the pieces apart. Add to that North Carolina system of service provision, innovations waiver, which is now being folded into care management, is the whole new set of acronyms to learn and to memorize and forget. And, and the, the tendency is to say, well, gee, it's all the politicians' fault. Let's blame, let's blame the legislators. It's you guys screwed this up. Yeah. And yet I've done this on two coasts now. I've done it in California. I've done it in North Carolina. The letters behind the people's names are completely the opposite. There's more Republicans here in North Carolina. There's more Democrats in California. And I guarantee the issues are exactly the same. It does not change because there is a pie and it's only so big. And you have to decide how we're going to divvy that pie up. And when you start talking about things that are already compartmentalized services, Trust me, when I talk about services, we had an issue here not too long ago where somebody, a service provider, could not afford to pay staff to support people in a location. And so he just arbitrarily said, tell you what, we're going to move these people and pecked them up and moved them. Didn't bother to tell me about this. Now, I don't do services in the homes we own. We do do some services in other places, but not in the places we own. And I spent a lot of time with HUD. The people that live in these places have tenant rights. You own a house, you rent a house, you rent an apartment, you have rights that come with that rental and that ownership, right? So does somebody with a disability, except that the services that I have to have, and gee, you have a disability, wouldn't you like to come over here and live here? And coercion is intentionally benign, but it's still coercion. And so we pick somebody up and arbitrarily move them. And what happens is their rights are violated. And I see this all the time. And, and who do you blame? Where do you point the finger? And the answer is we have, I hate the term silos. I grew up in a rural community. Silos have a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> silos are useful if they're put to, put to the proper use. Compartmentalization in this environment has a problem. And we always focus on a single piece. Let's find housing or let's make sure we have DSPs, direct support staff in place but we fix one little problem and it pops up someplace else. We we've, we've shifted the burden from one thing to the next and we keep chasing down these rabbit holes. And the answer to me, we have to be able to look at the whole person. This is why the ARC has been very supportive of care management and the approach to this because it looks at the whole person. Now, I think there are some significant issues with the program. I think it, the idea is the right idea. I think the direction is the right idea because it looks at the whole person. If you're looking at, at housing and what the resource is to be able to provide for somebody living in the community, 
HUD doesn't have the same set of rules that CMS has, and the state has a different set of rules altogether. And that's not a bad thing. It's just everybody's doing their own thing. And most of the time, very rarely, are there bad actors in this crowd. It's everybody trying to do the right thing. But when you have so many people trying to do the right thing in different places, at the end person, the person that lives, where do they want to live? Do they want to live? In the, and sometimes we say, well, we don't want congregate settings. So we shut down group settings. Anything more than four or three or six or whatever that number arbitrarily needs to be. I've read the Olmstead decision. It doesn't say anything like that. But what I think has happened is we forgot about the person. We've said, well, this must be the case. And so a group setting is inappropriate. What we need to be looking at is what is the array? We have, I was talking to somebody earlier, we have autism spectrum disorders. We have fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. We have acuity tiers that says people with disability have different levels of needs. And, and need I, my apologies for saying it, but we talk about what is the functional level of this person? This one's a two-year-old, this one's an eight-year-old, this one's a 15-year-old. And we use that to kind of quantify, and that's an inappropriate in my opinion, but it does identify our need to be able to, to, to create an array of options that fits people. And, and mental illness, substance use, and other issues aside, in the IDD world, you have all those things and then some, and every person, anybody you've ever interacted with is different. So why can we not create a spectrum of housing options? And that means that we have to basically look at this differently and maybe approach not just a single piece of this, but come together under intellectual developmental disabilities community, you all here, and create an overarching plan. How do we help our loved ones live independently, as independent as possible throughout their life? Which means that at some point, just like everybody else in this room, my father's 94 and lives in a retirement center. Four years ago, he was still shoveling ditches. So as he's gotten older, his needs for support have increased. Same thing goes for IDD, only quicker and probably more intensive. So my thought is we need to come together and come up with a different approach to this in the IDD community than, than we have traditionally. Don't separate it out, bring it under one piece and see what we can do differently. Thanks, John. That's really interesting. Uh, Representative Price, do you want to come say something? Uh, Representative Price is on the Regulatory Reform Committee in the House. And the IDD caucus. And I'm the IDD caucus. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. I just wanted to um, add a little bit to the conversation. I'm currently in the House, but spent 10 years as the county commissioner and also have a background in uh, community development. And I think one of the things that's missing in the discussion is at the local level. Mm -hmm. And as we were trying to find housing, you know, trying to address the housing need for people, you know, perhaps, as you mentioned, uh, you know, group homes or even independently, whatever. There's, the zoning is a big problem. We're going to get to that subject oh, later. Okay. That, well, I was just saying that's a big problem. And also, even the most well-intentioned people will say, not next door to me, mm -hmm. not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And it was surprising to me, the people that were saying this and, uh, or trying to, you know, but in, um, well, basically that we're saying this, that did not want that. But I, uh, one of the uh, issues that we were trying to attack locally, you know, in Orange County, as well as across the board, because I was part of the uh, association, North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, was to break the stigma of people with, you know, with IDD or any, any type of disorder. It, these are people, just like you just said, you know, we're talking about human beings and not just a category or a label. And I think that's important. And, and I am surprised coming from New York where I actually worked in housing and community development that there isn't one such, you know, a state level department like that here in North Carolina. And I know there was a recommendation for that, but it went nowhere. But I, I do think that we also have to consider what's happening at the local level um, with zoning, even with, um, uh, with space. I mean, uh, Mr. Levin would know this, you know, dealing with, you know, what is prime real estate? Where do you want to have, you know, you talk about having a, 
people near transportation or near services, but that's also where a lot of, you know, oftentimes where you're going to have the most expensive real estate because you've got offices and other entities like that. So it's, it's, it's local, state, and federal. Great. Thank you, Rep Representative Price. You've been wonderful on this. Yeah. Uh, timekeeper, oh, timekeeper, how are we doing? Oh. <laughs> um, so I, I really want to um, say that I, I agree with Dave um, Rio, about the need to have some precision as to what it what, what it is that um, the rules are um, for how many people can live in a home, whether you can have a farm, all of these things, I mean, we may not like the answers, or we may like the answers, depending on our perspective, um, but to really understand that. And, and I think the reason there's so much gray is that the settings rule essentially says that um, folks are supposed to live as integrated as possible, and the state needs to design their waivers to make sure that that happens. And then CMS is going to decide whether or not to approve the waiver based on that, and, um, and then it's going to come check on folks. And the reason for that again, is that we've never had choice. Um, and so a lot of other states have choice. If you go to Maryland, if you go to Wisconsin, which is a pretty similar state to ours, you can live independently as a person with a developmental disability. You can live in a um, more integrated housing setting. Here in North Carolina, you just simply can't. And, without, and so from the Fed's perspective, trying to implement Olmstead, they want there to be a requirement that the states make sure things are as integrated as possible. But where that leaves us is this grayness where the state doesn't want to say yes to things because they don't want to get in trouble with the feds. Um, and at the same time, you don't have any clarity as to what you can and can't do. And so if you have a farm, does it mean that you need to have um, 60% or 70% of the people who live there not have a developmental disability, what does it mean? The answer you get is probably you can't do that, but you don't get any real clear answer. And so the more we could try to come together to get some precision as to what the answer is, I think would be helpful for all of us. Agreed, Sally. Thank you. All right, well, our last very, how much time do we have before 1030? Five is <laughs> not. <laughs> right. Well, like I said, there's lots of overlap. And the last bucket that I'm gonna be moderating uh, is slow and conflicting information. I think we've already begun to hit on that pretty hard. Um, answers depend upon who you talk to within an agency, between agencies. Agencies like Medicaid have to get approval from CMS. Um, anyway, everything is very slow. And uh, Dave, you've already mentioned the different service, or Laura, different service definitions for the same thing. Um, do we need a, a designated person in each agency or that still sounds bad, um, but somebody championing IDD. IDD housing. Okay, IDD housing. <laughs> well, doesn't that go back to the needing a, a state level, like Representative Price said, state level housing department? I mean, it seems like something that's been missing all yeah. along. Is this a Tim is asking if yeah, he can come. Oh, yeah. You have to come up here, Tim. Yeah. Two minutes. Well, Tim Gallagher from Greensboro, right? Yeah, Winston Salem, Greensboro. Okay. Uh, I'll give Winston Salem credit, though. <laughs> um, so I love the words persistence, you know, specific. Um, we don't measure, and we certainly don't include the people in this room. I'm not tied to my daughter at all anywhere. The state calls our house and asks to talk to her, even though she'll never answer the phone. Can you speak up? Speak up. Yeah, it, it's rude the way that natural supports are left out of the lives of the people we're talking about. Nobody talks to my daughter without her guardian present. Yet people call the house and want to talk to her. The state gives the information to the insurance company. The insurance company calls up to talk to us. We got to prove who we are before they'll actually talk to the nurse. Specificity is just the wrong word with me. None of us are included right now. We don't have rights. Housing is not just housing. You know, everything that we measure 
is like illness, not thriving. We got to change the way we measure. The absence of things is what causes the damage. We're fighting for scraps. These are rights, all right? And the fact that they don't measure us as a community, Forsyth County can't produce the number of people that are on an IDD. They don't even capture that. Nobody does. Nobody does. And we surveyed, there's 7,000 people living at home with aging parents. Like mm -hmm. what other counties have done that? We're a force if we're connected and we're just not allowed to be connected, whether it's silos or some other word, we're a force because we have to be. And yet we're not aggregated yet in any fashion. And so I love the language, but basic measurement. Last week, we had four shifts that went unmeasured. Nobody knows except us. So that's... Okay. Thanks, Tim. Tim actually has a project going with Piedmont Triad. I think they're trying to develop a, an IDD-specific housing complex. Yeah, we, we're one of 300 doors. 300 doors. Yeah. Carol, okay. Carol yeah. just, um, I know Jeff brought up uh, on yesterday's uh, conference, you know, a question, and then Barbara, um, you know, brought up a question. And <clears throat> Barbara, could you just speak real briefly? It took me one second. It took me three days and about seven people to get to the answer I was looking for. Um, and it involves some chat GPT to, to research some things. It involves the internet and involves so many different things. Um, the choice thing, I feel, I would love someone to explain to me why, like, when I became Gunner's legal guardian, I, his goal was to four, and I sat in front of the uh, clerk of court in Moore County, we were living in Pinehurst at the time. Um, she asked him what things he would like to re retain, like different rights. He has the right to vote. He wanted the right to vote, and he wanted the right to the choice of where he can live. He can choose where he lives. So until someone explains to me how in a private model or otherwise, like someone can't choose, I simply don't get it. But that's it. That's okay. it. So well, let's just um, anyone in here. I just want to know, is Anna Oshel here? <laughs> yeah. Where are you? Right here. Oh, there you are. Okay, that. Definitely want to call on you a little bit later. So we're going to take um, a 10 minute break, maybe lead into 15, um, <laughs> here in the room. <laughs> Um, Dave Curl is going to take over moderating uh, the last four buckets. I think this has been a great discussion so far. So please help yourself to donuts, coffee, and granola bars. Please it's here in the room, online, anything you want. <laughs> uh, please don't go away. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
We'll have some time at the end for concluding remarks. Yeah. yeah, can we please get started? We'll have time at the end for. Uh, remarks and, and comments and stuff. I know, it'd be great. It really is great. It really is great. Can someone take years? <laughs> no. You're not switching on care? Hey, Dave. Good. Before somebody starts to um, speak, can you ask them to introduce themselves? Yeah, um, I will. Yeah. It was just asking the timeline. It's yeah. our idea. Well, welcome back. I know there's a few NPCs that probably lost the funny bathroom. Or like that. Or like that. Yeah. So in the first half, one of my takeaways is that when we're talking about the IDD population, we're talking about a spectrum, like John would say. I mean, there are people that can get along pretty well, not the boss, good work, go find their doctor. And then there are folks that can't. So there's a whole spectrum of housing solutions that are needed for these folks. Um, and that's kind of why we have such a diverse panel. So let's get, let's get into it here. Uh, our next question or our next barrier topic is silos. So I think John put it well, silos, probably not a good word. Compartmentalization. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking of the court. Um, so you can't always mix funds for different agencies or different pots within the same agency. So uh, there's seven state agencies dealing with housing, and you need to engage non housing agencies as well. Uh, and it's not just the state, too. You're going to deal with the county and the city. Um, so let's start with Laura. <laughs> Don't put me on the spot. Man. Yeah. Uh, Laura Wells from Oak. Um, you said aging funds can't support mixed projects. So yeah, well, this is something that, again, with us trying to use low-income housing tax credits, I think there's a um, some other complexities that come into it for, for many of the panelists, that's not an issue. But um, there, one of the things is that if you, um, we want intergenerational communities. You know, we believe the relationships, the mutual benefits that come from all ages living as neighbors are, are helpful, not just for people with IDD, but older adults are also isolated often and lose some of their network. And the younger generation is struggling right now. We all know there's anxiety and depression out the wazoo. So, and research shows the benefits from those intergenerational relationships, not just for older adults, but also for young people. However, when you go for funding um, using low-income housing tax credits, you can apply for over 55 funding, or you can apply for uh, multifamily. There's no such thing as like applying for both in the same project. So, um, you know, one of the things we've looked at is, is it possible to um, have an over 55 community and set aside some of those units for folks with IDD? So you'd have a mixture of older adults and people with IDD as long as it's not more than 20% of units. Anyway, it's far too complicated. It's just to say that there's 
there's often these barriers that are related to funding and you have to take your model, which you think is the best for health and wellness and everything. And you have to say, well, we can't do that because that's the structure of the way the funding is. And to me, that's frustrating. We should be able to say, this is what's best and figure out, you know, easy ways to fund it, but there's no such thing. Absolutely, no such thing. Anyone else have experience with that? I, I, I think that, that <laughs> thanks Dave. The, um, Dave had a great uh, event at the, the Methodist Church and you know, they're amazingly supportive of your tiny house community and met some great people, so thank you Dave. Um, the silos, the one thing that, that I think of with silos is parents with their child. I mean, <laughs> is, is that living at home? I mean, I know it's, you know, it, it, the questions about mixing state agencies or whatever, but, you know, we're talking about the, the person here, right? I mean, we're talking about the person with IDD and the parent, and, you know, it, you know that can be as isolating as... I mean, these are young adults that want to be adults, right? I mean, they they uh, they want to also be independent of their parents, and I think that that to me is the ultimate silo that you know we need to address by by having inventory and and choice. I mean, all these people you know here are been working their tails off to you know try to create you know models and housing and and opportunities, you know, just to have four beds with large and, you know, 10 beds over there and 10 beds there and four here. I mean, how about, you know, total this up. We're talking, uh, you know, the inventory that isn't, you know, we have four built beds, they're filled, you know? <laughs> so the silo is the unmet need here, right? I mean, I think that's the ultimate thing. Awesome. So, teacher, I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh, <laughs> that's me. Teacher, I don't know how to fire the agency. Um, Mark was talking about you can't use light tech funding for um, multiple sources. Can you do that with the supportive housing development program? Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Try to get to the owl. So what we do is step up to the owl okay. and then say your name and where you're from to the people. Okay. The Thank you. I am at the owl. You guys can hear me. I'm Keisha from North Carolina Housing Finance. I am with the Supportive Housing Development Team. I do not do development for tax credits, so we're going to preface that right there, okay? <laughs> but I am familiar with tax credit developments that have family buildings, and then an elderly project. So it's entirely possible to do that. I believe it would just be under phases. And separate buildings. You can't you can do it do in separate, separate buildings. Well, you can, if it's a family building, that takes elderly. That takes anybody. So I need you whomever. Can you do that with uh, North Carolina funds? Now with our supportive housing funds, yeah. our supportive housing, we want it to have a special needs population. Okay, so a special needs population can be homeless, at risk of homeless, domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, youth aging out of foster care, group homes. We have the gamut so with you our can, supportive housing funds. Yeah, in, in a single development, you can combine a lot of those? You can combine different special needs populations? Correct. We've got properties that have six special needs populations. Okay. I mean, they... Anybody that's got different disabilities, they take homeless, we'll take them. For what it's worth, well, um, uh, just do I need to, for what it's worth getting... under HUD regulations, disability <laughs> is a combination. So IDD under their, their 811 program, if you have somebody with, with IDD and you decide to build a, a broad-based integrated settle, setting, you can mix IDD in with veterans with disabilities, with mental illness. I mean, as far as the, the HUD 811 for disabilities programs go, it's that congregate setting for them is based on just 
IDD and everybody else, all the other potential conditions that we might be dealing with are, that, that's open to them. So you, if you wanted to build an, a retirement facility and dedicate 20% of those locations to somebody with IDD and the rest of everybody else is aging, you could do the entire program under their 811 setting if they had resources to do it. And you would still be meeting their criteria and CMSs. So there's some, there's some intricacies to the program just because there are other disabilities or other things that we would consider to be a disability folded into that. It's open-ended to include lots of different parties that, that we might be able to take advantage of. So John, John Nash from the ARC. Yeah. So John from the ARC, I have a question. Okay. Uh -oh. So is that, <laughs> is, is HUD 811, I know that's for rent, right? But can you get capital funds to build out with that? Yeah. yeah. Um, They've got our money. I've got a ton of capital <laughs> tied up. It's two pieces, and this is where it gets complicated for if you're going to do that. There is the development funds, which under the 811 program, that requires a use agreement that locks that property into a use for people with IDD, mental illness, or aging adults for 40 years. So before you sign on that dotted line for the 811 resources, make sure you're ready to use that property for 40 years. Build the foundations really strong. And then along with that comes the, the subsidy or the voucher that says, once you've moved somebody in, there are rental assistance that says, you know, whatever, and in our case under 811, it's 30% of the individual's annual income, whatever that income is, if it's zero, 30% of zero is still zero. If they have SSI and any amount coming in is 30% of that, HUD picks up the difference. HUD establishes the rental rate. So in some of our cases, that rental rate is not real high, but right. you know, that's, but John, that's in that case, you wouldn't be able to have families or individuals without disabilities. There are that circumstances are not where you can have family, it, a family can live in an 811 unit, but there are some special circumstances and there's some limits to what we can do with that. And you got to find a property that has multi-room housing. That's harder to come up with, but it's doable. There are, some, there are some circumstances where you can, and we have families living in some of our scattered site locations around the state. So, so that would be a third source of capital. Yeah. Like okay. I said, the only the only hang up is if you're going to sign on the 811 dotted line and it is a viable program, they actually came to me a year ago and said, hey, we can, we can renovate some of your new your places that have been there. Our use agreements are almost up on some of those. So we're at like 38 years. Hey, we can do this and here you go. And here's the contract. And by the way, you're going to sign up for another 40 years that you cannot, if you use this for anything other than the purpose intended, all the money that you receive is now due and payable immediately. There is no, you, you got to, you got to cup up, pop up the cash. So you're locked in. Dave. Hold on. Uh, I'll get you a second. Tally. Uh, Mark. Oh, so does Alan. I, I, I would really encourage people to read HB 1003. Um, I want to give a lot of credit to Laura Wells, full disclosure, she's my wife, um, <laughs> for working with the legislature. Um, and um, and there is a, a bill now um, that specifically has 200 housing vouchers for people with developmental disabilities for each year for the next five years. So a thousand over the next five years. It's more of a roadmap, according to Representative Hawkins, but Representative White, who is on here, is one of the co-sponsors. So it's a bipartisan bill. And um, right now is a great time to be asking the candidates on both sides of the aisle, like how many of you have gone to a, a something with one of the two gubernatorial candidates right now and ask them questions about IBD? So three people. So we have about 60 people who could be asking these questions of both of the gubernatorial candidates and each of the legislators who are running for office right now, what their thoughts are about that. And, and the bad thing about a state housing voucher is the money can come or go with the legislature. The good thing about a state voucher is you don't have a lot of these rules that we're talking about right now in terms of whether there's a housing voucher. And so I would encourage everybody to read HB 1003. And I'm not saying whether or not I'm for or against it. <laughs> but... Dave, do you want to ask Ann Oshel? I certainly do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any thoughts on this? 
Um, having watched many people on the owl, I'm going to carefully place myself. Thank so, you. Um, that uh, I, I probably could have a lot of things to say that there's not enough time for, but hearing this conversation, uh, and especially from the LME MCO point of view, I have to say I agree with everybody on everything. And <laughs> Um, and one of the things that we've learned is this is hard. There's many times it feels impossible. There's, it can be so overwhelming that it's paralyzing and you just have to keep going. Um, and because, you know, 12 years ago when we started TCL and I was at the LME MCO when the ink dried on that settlement and I thought, what have we done? Do, do people not realize that none of these systems that it's going to take to accomplish this exist? And we're 11 years and an eight year settlement. And so clearly it's because it's hard, getting harder in some ways, but it also has, um, we've learned a lot that we can apply to the next challenge coming with Samantha R and everybody that is not included in Samantha R. And I guess the only thing that I would wanna say is that, um, you know, one of the things that I've learned, I've been in public service for more than 35 years is change only moves at the speed of trust. And, you know, and I, I've known Ginger a long time. I trust Ginger. If I call her and say, this isn't working, like, are you all thinking about this? Can we talk about this? We may not always agree. It may not happen as quickly as we need to, but I trust when Ginger says, let me think about it. Let me call you back because I know she will. I trust the housing finance agency. I don't always agree with them, but I send everybody with a great idea to Keisha first <laughs> because if nothing else, they're going to get technical assistance. They're going to learn how hard this is. And then she's going to help them figure out how you keep going. And, you know, and I think that's just, you know, as we embark on things that are unprecedented, you just have to keep going um, because it, it takes one thing that's worked to, to set everybody else up for the success and the acceleration that they need. It's still going to be slow. And I just, you know, I want to take a second to talk a little bit about Alliance's commitment to this issue. Um, because we believe housing is healthcare, you know, and um, I grew up on a farm. I silos, absolute, I have stomped more silos than I ever want to, if my, and still hear my dad say it builds character. But, you know, <laughs> but that, um, and, you know, but we're fragmented, you know, it's a very fragmented system and there's, there's um, archaic rules still in the system they get passed down from one generation to the other and you're like where did that come from and nobody really knows but it's still we still speak it as if it's the truth um and you know and so to challenge some of that to start with policy i think is is how we keep going because there are and then you start somewhere and you just have to celebrate the success when you start somewhere and so um, you know, in partnership with Hope, um, Alliance has made its first capital investment into a nonprofit um, to do 10 set asides for IDD. Um, it's we need a thousand, but, but we and this is what we learned from TCL um, is that us investing our own money with nonprofits. We've done LIHTC deals. I feel you on the money. I mean, we have a we're a little different I, source of money, but those deals are so complicated. We had to hire a real estate attorney to help us figure it out, you know, because we're going to protect our assets, even if it's just a little <laughs> bit, you know, and we do grants, we don't do loans. Um, and so everybody now, when, you know, I have three meetings next week with LIHTC developers who have financing gap. And now we know a quid pro quo. We'll give you a little bit of our money and in return, you can't refuse anybody that we send there to live. You can't evict people that we send to live. You, If you have a problem on that property, we have somebody at Alliance that you can call all the time. So, you know, we've gotten really good at faking it till we make it, that our money comes with strings attached. You are good to our people, you are fair to our people, you house our people, you keep our people housed. 
and you know, and they are like everybody else that lives there. So we are um, largest said they hired the community facilitator for Grobner. So, you know, we got five people in the next month that are gonna move from families and from institutions into this lovely, lovely property. Thank Is you. it gonna be magical? Probably not. <laughs> Is it, you know, do I have 10 other things lined up? No, but I'm, you know, but I'm coming, I'm coming for you, Jeff, you know, on, on all of these things that create the next opportunity to do this. So that I agree with everybody. And my thing is we just all have to keep, we have to keep going. Absolutely. Thank you, Ian. Low income housing tax credit is a federal program. And TLC, <coughs> define TLC, but TCF. 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 Transitions TCF. to community living. <laughs> One thing Ian did say that I want to harp on is that we we do have fractured regulations and bureaucracy. And I've always told people that you know fractured rules make fractured people. Um so that's one thing we have to work through. And she knows this as well. My, my middle name is Hester. <laughs> and I'll test you to death to get support for our, our folks. Okay. Um, Ginger, did you have a comment since she mentioned your name? Um, no, but I do want to mention that we are. Uh, oh, 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 yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Ginger Yarborough from DHHS. Apparently, I do not learn by watching other people. Um, so, um, I do want to mention that we've got our Inclusion Connects um, initiative that has launched, and one of the big pillars is around housing and community living and getting the supports. Um, also, as we talked about before, um, it's hard to have housing, successful housing, without supports in place and without the DSPs. So um, before the end of this month, God willing, our DSP work plan will be published. And so I encourage you all to look at that. Um, also remember it is a living document. Um, so we appreciate all feedback there as well. So Thank you. put that out there. So, yeah. <laughs> so we'll have, in, at the end of this, we'll have plenty of time to network with each other and have a private conversation because I certainly have a lot in mind. Um, <laughs> Let's move on to the next topic, which is local limits. And uh, requirements vary by city and situation. Zoning, permitting, environmental review, requirements are hard to do without expensive lawyers and paying fees. Amen. Um, and I, I can tell you that the uh, in Durham, specifically, they just changed a lot of the zoning rules for ADUs. Um, Spelled out. <laughs> accessory dwelling units. Thanks, Carol. Um, so accessory dwelling units can be like a tiny home. And on church property, you can build up to 10 without zone changes. Um, also, they did away with parking requirements, which takes up a lot of land. So, but that's in Durham. Uh, Wake County, I have no idea. It's Laurie Shaker didn't know. Laurie County has done it too. Laurie County has done it. So there's movement there. Durham just did it last fall. Um, so Laurie number two. Yes. <laughs> um, we've got local laws and distance between group homes and all that. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Laura Lorena from Larch, North Carolina. And um, just wanted to share uh, some of our challenges for our first home, not our last home. Uh, when we were uh, looking for our first home, we had a donor who provided a $200,000 uh, donation to us. Uh, and so that would provide a down payment. And we uh, were looking in Wake County um, was our original plan. And, uh, you know, Wake County is a little bit more expensive than, than Durham County. Wake County and Durham County both have zoning laws that you cannot have one licensed, and they both call them something different. Uh, so supportive assisted living and or family care home, depending on which county. You cannot have one uh, within 1,225 feet of another 
uh, group home. Uh, and so that's about a quarter of a mile. So as we're looking to find an affordable place that is connected to a bus system, has green space, um, safe uh, with sidewalks uh, for our future core members and uh, assistants, the first thing we do is we plug that into GIS and see, is there another licensed group home around there? And it was extremely difficult to find in Wake County. We were unsuccessful um, within our price limits um, to find one that was not located within another um, quarter of a mile from another. That goes back to the conversation. All these, as you shared, Carol, are interwoven, goes back to the previous conversations about choice and who can live where and how many homes you can have beside one another. I've already named the cost um, as one of the hurdles that we had to overcome, but having two homes next to one another is helpful because then we can have one uh, staff person uh, provide a ride to another. And um, there's just so many perks, of course, of having closer homes. In Orange County, I know it's only 500 feet. So every area has its own um, understanding of how they're interpreting the, the distance between locations. So that was our, our biggest hurdle. John from New York. Maybe a suggestion possibly for our friends in the legislature to consider, because I've run across this myself, mm -hmm. that if you, municipal codes being what they are, group homes cannot be within a certain proximity. Our problem is in the terminology. In all the years that I've worked in state and federal legislative, words mean something. And most of the time, for most of the people we're talking to in the municipalities, think a group home is a halfway house. And I've heard them refer to that. Oh, you got a halfway house. And a halfway house has a much different connotation. They assume that what we have in our group settings are degenerate, evil, awful people that are going to, to beat up and assault my family members that are living right next door to each other. Ergo, we are not going to let you put one there maybe what we could do is ask for a reclassification for IDD specifically, that these are no longer called group homes, call them something else, a family living setting, a congregate people with IDD, we could come up with an acronym, we're pretty good at that, but call it something else and put it, because it's no longer, if we don't call it a group home, it no longer fits under those municipal codes. And we can put them, as close together as we wanted because, I mean, other than the regular population, is there any more danger from somebody with IDD than there is from the regular, everybody else in the communities that we live in? Well, the, I believe that the original, where this came from was, was specifically for those who are living in the homes to have a fully integrated uh, community. And what is stopping uh, a parent from buying a home next to another parent, um, if it's if it's not licensed, it's not a big deal to have a fully integrated yeah. community. Our folks are going to be fully integrated into the community, and if we had someone around the corner living, they would also have a fully integrated community. So the origination of the rule is no longer valid, and instead it's muni municipalities saying, not in my backyard, we got enough, and regardless of yeah. who it is. Yeah. Senator. Thank you. Um, and also lawyer. So I, I'm, I'm going to actually do the lawyer thing for a minute. So, so what is, you know, first of all, I, there's, there's an ADA issue, right, with having a, a discriminatory zoning rule. Um, and there's a whole a string of cases, I think maybe from the 90s or so around Oxford houses, which are rehab houses for folks with alcoholism. Um, and so, you know, I, I would be curious about that. But one of my questions for you is whether, whether um, folks were, um, have approached any of these municipalities or local governments about changing those rules, right? Just kind of at the local level. And, and then I would say at the state level, um, so, so you know, so these are friendly governments, right? I'm happy to help with outreach, particularly in Wake County, if that's helpful to you. Um, but um, but from the legislative point of view, I would, I, rather than read, we could work out this, we'll figure it out, John. So <laughs> rather than change the name, I would just say, you can just bar people from discriminating in housing. You know, again, we have uh, statutes that do that at the, uh, the ADA, and we have state sure. law actually about housing discrimination as well. Um, and so, but we could do something more specific to say that to bar municipalities from um, preventing people from building group homes in proximity. Because there's the rationale you talked about, like the, about, um, you know, whatever the bias might be, 
Um, I don't think in terms of congregate settings, mm -hmm. I don't think that that's the motivation at the municipal level. Um, I, because they're, they're not used to thinking about things like HCBS settings rules. What that is, to me, it's probably more like they, they, they didn't want the, you know, the, um, rehab facilities or, you know, halfway houses. Well, right. A consideration on the West Coast in California, there is a very prominent law firm that sends people in wheelchairs into public facilities, stores, grocery stores, shopping centers, wherever. And they walk, they, they will go into the restrooms and into the facilities with measuring tapes and say, okay, and they come with, with measuring devices to measure the pull on the doors to how wide are the restrooms, how big are the, the hallways. And you don't know that they've been there until you get the lawsuit. And they win every single time. And this is a legal system in California that has a much different set of circumstances, but it's the same thing. No community wants to face an ADA, and I would rather take a cooperative approach. Mm -hmm. But I hadn't thought about the ADA approach on that, and that right. may be something we may look at. Please. Just because, why discriminate on this group when I don't think that was the original intent? Yeah, and we had some issue with the city council years ago when I first started disability rights. And here's my colleague, Lisa Nesbitt, who does our housing work. So... She can actually probably do the lawsuit for you. <laughs> we gotta use the fair housing act yeah, too. Oh yeah, yeah. the fair housing. Act. So just, I, just very quickly on that, I I um Kelly. I represented a, a, a couple of, of of homes in uh, Georgia in some of these ADA um, NIMBY issues, and I would encourage sort of a dual approach um, because it, it, the ADA is absolutely the law and people have to follow it, but it's also the right thing to do. And so getting the county commissioners or the, the friendly folks in your zoning group and the law involved, I found to be a pretty helpful tactic. So they sort of decide to back down and you don't really know, are they backing down because you keep citing the law or because you're citing the right thing to do? I'd like to ask Tim Gallagher uh, about this also. Um, I understand you pointed out that California has overridden the local zoning as it pertains to faith-owned lands. Yeah, I think Durham County did. did yeah, he's, yeah, yeah, Durham just did that. But this is the state yeah, has overridden. SB4, which gave... Just uh, introduce yourself. Please. Hi, Tim. Um, good to see you. There's a lot of people in the room. I'm going to try to help you down. <laughs> um, SB4, as I understand it, Speak is um, the state legislator in California, and we're going to try to copy this, they allowed churches, so faith organizations, and other nonprofits, I think specifically uh, community colleges, so educational facilities, to use their land any way they deemed fit. Well, not really. They still had to go through a permitting process, but it was an accelerated permitting process. And it was mainly because COVID, uh, a lot of faith groups lost membership. And we have a lot of churches that don't have um, use of their buildings or, you know, they, they actually saw the need. They wanted having faith connected to IDD, but also homeless or other populations and letting them use their land and their assets as community benefit, right, is public-private partnership. And so I'm, I, I was interested in some of the conversation I think you led earlier was, we have to follow rules. We don't. If, if families want to come out of pocket and build land, we don't have to follow squat. Do whatever you want, right? The fact that we want our public benefits to come into harmony with how we want to live is what we're fighting. So there's a private role in make we're, we're citizens. We vote. We elect people. It, like we act like it's the state or it's the housing agency. We tell them, like, let's do it rationally. So did I answer your question? Yeah, I think so. So, and I wanted to personally address the NIMBY thing, not my backyard. Um, when we were looking for property for our project, we approached a church who was trying to do something in their land already. Their concern, because I told them we were going to probably use HUD money for rent subsidies, their concern was who's going to live there. So, as a board of directors, 
we all had kids that were on the um, IDD, or what is the spectrum of it? We all had kids that were IDD. So we brought them all in for a big meeting. We brought our kids in, introduced my son to everybody. He said a few words. Everyone said a few words. And after that was done, they agreed because they saw who was going to live there. And these are just, you know, the regular folks. Our kids are the regular folks. They just don't, they have different abilities. Hi. So, Hi. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Right on time. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Eric. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. There. No, 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 I'm sorry. no, I, I just for the lawyers in the room, you know, uh, the I think that um, I, I'm just asking, you know, the precedent law, you know, on ADA, um, you know, the term reasonable accommodations is, is such a magic word that you know that it, 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 and very relevant word that you know is is human and natural you know it's a reasonable accommodation but i i understand you know this uh, with the waiver and 1915c and appendix k you know i mean there's you know there's so many there's so many laws and they're, they're so the, the wording and, and how it's gotten approved and not approved and where to find it and all that stuff and the language and then interpreting it is is complicated can i ask the, the lawyers like is in the ADA, you know, in, in Laura's situation, in our situation, is there is there somewhere a case law uh, precedent that uh, in, in this group home slash IDD setting that that gives across the United States that we can reference? Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I don't know the answer. I was thinking back to the case law. You know, when we I look we. Looked at this ten years ago in the Oxford House context, so we have to follow up. I think unless unless somebody else has something off the top of their head, um, so you know, and Lisa, the other Lisa pointed out, um, you know, there's also Fair Housing Act uh, issues. So the question I think will, will ultimately come down to coverage and, and what entities are covered and whether zoning is covered and whether these kinds of rules can be covered. But you know, to me, there's there's all sorts of um, state federal uh, laws we can look at. Uh, but we'd, I'd have to research whether there's actually case law on this. But and sometimes people say, well, there, it must be legal because they're doing it, and that's typically not true with the ADA. Like people don't actually know the rules until you kind of point it out to them, and you know, sometimes it takes a conversation like this to realize that there's something to be explored. So should Laura be our uh, <laughs> first well, second? Was, to your point earlier, um, our legal team looked into uh, two previous cases in the state of North Carolina that did not win, um, and so they suggested we get this first house in an area where um, it's not a problem because there's so much need. We have over 25 people who applied to live at this first house, right. of course, but then to say, this is what we're doing and use that as an example to then fight it later on and because they thought that it could take too long mm -hmm. um, where um, for our first home. So I would yeah. love to yeah. collaborate later on for house number two, three, four, et cetera. Yeah, yeah no, definitely. I think Callie's approach is, is the right one. You can sort of use the, you know, paradigm stick. Okay, we're over time. We're okay. <laughs> How'd you know? Hit <laughs> his paper there. Um, developers. So it's hard to find private developers willing to set aside very low rent units. And I think we've talked about this a little bit. Um, so, Lori, you've had experience with that. Yeah, I mean, what Ann Osho, like you're over here still, <laughs> was pointing out. <laughs> um is you know there's incentive with these affordable housing developers that are coming to her and saying hey invest in this and she says well if you set aside some units we will but there's no incentive for market rate developers because in this market they can make a fortune and yet when you look at like what's going to be um as someone pointed out earlier i guess it was eric that you know quantity that we need to solve this problem across the state you know, we need more than what's at this table. And so how do we get buy-in from both affordable developers and market rate developers and everybody, you know, and whether they're building this model or that model or that model or whatever, it doesn't matter, but we need more people on board to make this happen at the scale we need it. 
Dave, Donna has a question. And Anthony. Where am I? There I am. I mean, X on the floor. Hi, I'm Donna. I'm Thomas's mom. So for any legislators that are sitting here, it's summer. Thomas works three days a week. He's here with me today because he has nothing else to do because he's one of 17,000 people on the waiting list for innovations waiver. But as Anne was saying, she is able to hold over these developers' heads. Hey, you want this from me. I want that from you. Well, all these other developments in the community are getting something from the city or the county. So I think this goes way back to where we need to have a more vocal voice at the city council, at the county commissioners, and let them know that there's people in their community that need this housing. So when someone is coming in and say, well, I would like some tax credit. I, I don't know the first thing about policy when it comes to housing, but we would like this zone for that, or we would like some tax credits for this. We need to make sure that our city council and our county commissioners know that we have needs too, and we they need to be holding our needs above the developers' heads and saying, okay, you want us to pay for that road or for that infrastructure? That's fine, but we need X, Y, Z for the IDD community. Is, so, is am I right to understand Lisa or Tally or um, other Lisa <laughs> that that's like inclusionary zoning right. and it, it's uh, illegal in the state of North Carolina for rental? Right. So, so for, so we have, uh, so that it was actually a great idea. And I was thinking the same thing that there needs to be action at the city council level right now is all has to be voluntary because right. we have, we have, we don't have inclusionary zoning, which is the power for local governments to make requirements on developers. So it's all very negotiated. Um, and I know in the city of Raleigh, a lot of it is, you know, trying to get affordable housing, getting some number of units and that's what they're advocating for. But it seems to me, it makes sense that the advocacy include you know, um, disability specific housing, if that's, but that's a, a matter of persuading the council and planning boards and so on that this is a valuable thing to do. So I think it's a great idea. Dave, yeah. This is one I think that I can speak into a little bit, what, <laughs> what we're doing. Um, and there's an approach, I'm actually gonna combine your seven and eight point here, the developers and the sustainability and scale. I mentioned a little while ago, I thought, I, I don't have, a decade or two of energy left in me, I don't think, to, to <laughs> bring something like this to, to existence. But we were very fortunate in what happened for us in Johnson County. Um, a developer had a daughter with autism and got the concept of the, you know what we were going to do with, um, I called it at that time an intentional community, but it really wasn't fully that. But um, he, in contributing the lots, um, we have, I saw something here that could be replicated. In fact, he even desires to replicate it too, and I'm very grateful for that. But I thought, what can be done to make more homes happen in a shorter amount of time? And I thought, in Johnson County, um, in Clayton, where we are, it is just booming right now. I'm, I, everywhere you look, there's a new development going up and more being planned. And I thought, how can we set things up in such a way so that we can begin to have ways of appealing to developers to look at setting aside lots that we can put homes on and be able to replicate this in a faster way. Um, and so we have begun forging relationships with city councils and with the county commission to begin looking at giving certain incentives or putting certain incentives in place for those who do. Um, one of the things that we've talked about, for example, we have developers who are wanting to put so many homes in a certain area and, and the city councils, of course, are pushing back and say, no, you need to scale this down or whatever. But one of the ideas that was put forth were was the idea of allowing greater density in exchange for, you know, the idea of contributing lots towards those with IDD right? and that we would take as a nonprofit and help develop. So this is one thing that we're trying, that we're exploring here to try to move it at a faster scale because, I mean, even if getting 10 homes up is going to be two or three years, but 
I long to see this happen faster because the need is out there. And so this is something, Donna, that we're trying to explore there is that relationship of getting to know your city council, getting to know your county commission, saying, okay, guys, would you consider giving some leeway here, you know, for those who will look at this as something that they want to do and, and contribute to here? So thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, come on. Let's stay out. Um, so come to the owl. That um, I so we've learned a lot about working with developers. There, there have been many conversations where they're talking four percent, nine percent, and I'm under the table googling what the hell is that. <laughs> um, and so, but I can talk about schizophrenia and IDD, and they're like, what the hell is that? So, but you know, so we. We we found a way over all these years to come together, and I think that this is why I'm so encouraged by this conversation. And thank you to our CFAC. We're super proud of you for gathering people. And I think you've got a lot of the right people in the room. Clearly, we need disability rights to be part of this advocacy. But but this is where you know I, I we have to begin with the end in mind. Like, what are we working towards? Because sometimes it's piecemealed. And it's more piecemeal than we want it to be, but, but it's a start. So for instance, we did negotiate with the city of Raleigh that if a developer gets a letter of support from us, they have to give us 5% set asides at no cost to us and every property that the city of Raleigh funds. We've gotten like 17 units, didn't cost us a thing, and we have a support of services and plan with those developers. Awesome. So. You know, now will the city of Durham do that? Will the city of Fayetteville do that? You know, but but clearly, you know, there are municipalities from the city that funds developments who like if you go and talk to them and now we'll have IDD services plans at this. I might get four units at a property, but for four people, that's created a home. And, you know, and so if, and if I do four more and, and so, you know, the other thing that just to think about is these conversations progress, um, you know, HUD, you can't leave HUD out of this conversation. Um, and I hope, uh, John, the person you've been talking to was Richard Cho, um, you know, because I think he is a pretty progressive thinker. I mean, you know, he's one person in the vastness of a federal government you know, always looming for a shutdown, but when you can get his attention, like he can really, like he takes things, I believe that he does, you know? And so when HUD had several rounds of a special appropriation of mainstream vouchers, I hear what you say about HCVs. Those waiting lists are like waiting for innovations. The waiting list for targeted units is like waiting on innovations. I mean, everywhere you go, it's, you know, you feel like you're hitting a brick wall. We took full advantage of those mainstream voucher appropriations. We partnered with three of our housing authorities. We negotiated an Olmstead agreement in those housing authorities and had 167 mainstream vouchers assigned exclusive to Alliance. Those are a humongous administrative burden for us. <laughs> um, and so we won't do it again. But but we had but we had access to 167 of those vouchers. We used almost all of them. Like none of them got returned, you know? So there are, there are, there are workarounds until you can work with and, you know, and it's really hard to do and you have to think carefully about what you're asking for, but there are, there are ways other than just the traditional paths that can get some stuff started and get some stuff done. So I encourage people to think about you know, policy, advocacy, I'm a big believer, like you got it, you know, again, some of these rules are so archaic, challenge, challenge the way it's always been done. And, you know, and, um, and I will just say kind of the flip side is one of the housing authorities that we negotiated, um, an Olmstead set aside, and it took disability rights and the Justice Center to go with us at that first meeting has revoked the agreement. So, you know, so you have to keep at it um, and keep working through every brick wall, but there are ways to think about, you know, it may not get to the scale that you want. You gotta find, you gotta, you gotta break ground on a development before I retire, Laura. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta get these tiny homes 
Dave, before I retire and I'm, I'm on a countdown to retirement. So, but you know, so what it's not, giving, <laughs> so it's not giving up where we ultimately want to be, but it's thinking about what are those things that could currently exist that help us do something other than nothing in the meantime. Okay, and Thanks, can, I, can I add a comment? Uh, thank you so much for, you know, those set aside. But one thing that, that comes up is a universal design for uh, handicap access in residential spaces. So I tell me, you know, are you, are you mandating ADA with these developers? So, um, can I just say this without coming to the outlet? <laughs> that, um, so, are we in a position to mandate? You know, I mean, we we do um, investments. Thank you, Dave. We do investments in new construction, which take a long time. And my good friend Josh here can vouch for how often I call him. And are say, they all wheelchair accessible? No, no, they're not. Okay. And but but that but those are rules beyond our control. Will we try to do a set aside for a fully accessible unit? I mean, we have a gentleman that we're working with now who needs a fully accessible two bedroom unit. Much to his despair, he's looking at at least four to six months, and there are before these are built, there are waiting lists for the fully accessible units. Right. Um. You know, will I pay a premium for a developer to include that in a set aside? Yeah. Have I? Had every single one of them tell me no, they can't. Yes, you know. Um, so, but that, but instead of not doing anything, we think, all right, how how close to accessible can we get? You know, can we have all your first round, first floor units? Can we, you know, can we have something while we get people on the waiting list for fully accessible units? Well, I think ADA has done an amazing job on the commercial space as an unfan unfunded mandate, you know, in commercial spaces. I think, you know, the population has, you know, adopted that. But in the residential world, it's, you know, 90% of even even this 99% uh, of the IDB space is, is wheelchair unaccessible. So the thing is, like, there's a reason that all of these these evolutionary you know, inventories that we're building are, you know, they're special. I mean, just a quick story, you know, we have a special needs van. You know, we wanted to, um, you know, travel, uh, camp. And, you know, so we looked at RVs during the pandemic and, you know, 100% of the Airstream manufacturers, the, the Georgie boys, the Coleman's, no one makes any wheelchair accessible stuff. I mean, that's the problem. The reason that we're here is because we have to develop special inventory. You know, it is, and it's special because it needs to be universally designed. It, it has a lot of criteria that also make it more expensive, you know, and as, as inventory goes, I mean, I'm sure his tiny homes are going to be, you know, have a zero threshold possibly. And, you know, he's, he's considering these things, you know, as important elements to, so our designs and why we talk about this housing world as special is because it's bespoke. It's, you know, all of our, our, our people require, you know, special criteria that is not, you know, available necessarily in the mass market. Do, um, let me ask a question to you real quick. <laughs> Thanks for being my cheerleader. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so we're guest spoke. Yeah. <laughs> so both of the innovations waiver, do they do they get um, help modifying apartments? For their special needs, they don't service. Or not to be temporary. Like you have to be limited. Yeah, correct. That's over $50,000. So there's a little bit of help in that area. I, before I get to tally, uh, I got a note from Commissioner Lee Altman, um, and she said on the chat, it would be great if county commissioners and city councils received an annual checklist targeted to the powers you actually have at our disposal of your request. So this is for us, for the, the people trying to develop housing. Um, 
that would help us understand what we can do at the local level to be helpful. It'd also be really important for you to sign up to speak during the public forum portion of city council's meetings to educate and make these errors. Yes. So what she's saying is get out and advocate to the, the powers that be. Um, thank you, Crystal. So tell them, you know, tell them. Yeah, I, I am continuing to focus on this upcoming election and how important it is. I mean, how disappointing it is that only three of us have actually talked to the gubernatorial candidates. There's a representative from the attorney general's office here today, um, and I think the AG capacity, but um, it's still sort of um, important that we are talking with the AG and the lieutenant governor, but also our local city council people. Laura's gotten to know every single Chapel Hill city council person to specifically talk about affordable housing. Housing, we have a son who is still with us after graduating from high school for the last three years. And the reality is that housing is incredibly unaffordable for our whole next generation, but particularly for folks with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And yet three of us have talked to our gubernatorial candidates. So Carol, I hope that you can use your platform. We use our platform to come up with some sort of challenge to really get people to know their legislators, their city council people, their candidates. Maybe we give them a point if they go to an event, five points if they get to know the person, 10 points if the person knows their name. Um, and it can be like Hogwarts, you get some special treat. Uh, what I was thinking about since we can't pay people is you get a chance to send out an email to Carol's entire group, uh, whatever you wanna say. But we really need right now to get to know all of these folks. And all of us need to be able to do that. Thanks, Sally. Actually, we had an event on the first and we had uh, Durham County Commissioner come out and Senator Woodard in the state. So do I get like an ice cream cone? Uh, you, you get a chance to talk to Carol about an email. Yeah, I well, I was going to get to Adam about these Haven. Yeah. With developing support, development support. Um, Neil's our chief strategy guy. He knows more about that than I do. Um, I might just kind of point out, just kind of throughout this conversation, um, Laura, you used the word discover earlier, which is uh, really, I don't know, it's been a discovery for all of us, right? Um, discovering so many things, local ordinances, um, legal issues, uh, CMS, HCBS. Um, just a lot of discovery happening, um, and it's kind of intense. Um, and so, if there are ways to expedite that discovery process so we can discover more efficiently, um, would be really beautiful. Whether that's like mentorship from providers who are doing this well and doing it for a long time, or state folks who are, are who know some things, um, all of the above would be really great. Um, development stuff, sure. and sustainability too. Yeah, uh, so you see that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Neil from Peace Haven. Neil, Neil Sharp from Peace Haven. Uh, a real quick note about what we're doing. So we're developing uh, a housing development, uh, housing development, uh, a community development. So rather than developing for profit, we're developing for community. Uh, that'll include housing, a community center, multidisciplinary health care clinic, art center, and farming operations. So we, we are on 90 acres of property. Um, particularly for housing, develop, developing integrated housing is uh, both philosophically uh, uh, central for us, as well as um, somewhat mandated kind of sort of ish as we're talking about today. Um, and so uh, rather than, I think, speak to the, the complexities, which we've been talking about in terms of the uh, HCBS uh, facets of developing housing, I'll say for us, sustainability looks like um, having market rate housing, um, and we're still developing the capital stack and, and understanding how we're going to and what we're going to include in that capital stack, whether we would take LIHTC dollars or affordable housing credits uh, that we might use with a, with a, another developer, uh, or if we will, if we'll just look to uh, use philanthropy mixed with kind of public and private dollars that come with less restrictive 
um, and uh, yeah, I'll just say less restrictive elements of that. So um, that that piece of uh, of what we're doing is is trying to accomplish sustainability and replicability, not just on our campus but other places. And so what we really hope to do is to develop a playbook that says here's here's the capital stack, here's how we got it, here's what was what was given to us uh, philanthropy wise. Um, take it take it and run with it. Uh, whether it's a, a piece or a facet of it, or um, you know, you want to take it the, the whole hog and, and, and do it yourself too. Um, all that's to say, we're we're in the midst of developing that. So um, I know Tim Tim worked with Stephen Sills, uh, the PTRC uh, Piedmont Triad Regional Council worked with Stephen Sills, who's a fantastic researcher and academic. Uh, and we're working with Stephen now, doing surveys. Some of you have talked with him. Really appreciate that. Uh, to to better understand the need and what that mixture might look like, um, but we hope to know more about that towards the end of the summer. And we welcome any feedback, like Adam said, and and conversations. We're pretty much an open book. Um, we're we're uh, Adam is an expert on a lot of things, uh, especially when it comes to the Medicaid side of things. The rest of us are just doing our best, uh, like the rest of you. But we're happy to share with anything we can. So. For sustainability and scale, um, I'll talk to Eric and Barbara. I'd, I'd like to give this one to Barbara. I, I think she, you need to get to the owl there. The <laughs> owl. <laughs> I, well, okay, I did have two. I did have a few. No, do I have to go over there? Yeah, no, no, no. Um, Ooh, what do I want to go to now? <laughs> <laughs> go to the owl. And for uh, Maryland Online, it was Neil Sharp from Peace Haven that was just me. Um, good morning. Still morning. Um, speaking of owl and Jamaica's connection, um, Eric and I took a trip with our son Gunner. Uh, we spent four nights, two nights in Charleston and two nights in Savannah recently in that van he's talking about that he didn't say, but he had to build out because mm -hmm. no builder would even touch it um, after we got the van. Um, we were told, I think, in the neighborhood of like two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars for them to do to the van what we needed done to it. With the waiver, we did get modification to put an under vehicle lift in it, and then now we just built it. So anyway, um, Charleston. Well, no, I'm not saying that, but the, the campground, one of the campgrounds, right, James Island State Park uh, or County Island, had an owl. They said, look for the owl, the twenty foot owl. That's beautiful. so we love camping. We've camped all across across the country. Wonderful thing. Um, Charleston gets F's per sidewalks because mm -hmm. if you've ever done a cobblestone and wheelchair combination, yes. um, it's train wreck. And so I think when we're talking about the IDD community, we always think of Gunner. And I know, and I'm speaking when I say Gunner, I mean all the people on the waiting list. He's not. But if you're on the waiting list, I think I just think that's we have to change. That. <laughs> we have to change that. I don't know where our family would be without it. Um, Gunner has to be positioned in his chair every uh, 20 minutes for three minutes, readjusted. Mm -hmm. So to give you an idea of like where we come from, um, and I'm not saying it's a different place, but we have need. He has significant need. I'll go back to my notes. So in regard to number eight, I had written last night, um, we do not believe that consistent fundraising is sustainable in the long term. Just because a person has a disability does not mean that they should spend their lives as recipients to the exclusion of being contributors. And I think when we limit people and don't allow them to have the waiver or the housing choice voucher or SSI, I think SSI is in pretty good shape um, if they live separately getting food stamps. If we don't give them these things to allow them to just be and live, I think that we're violating all sorts of rights. And that maybe is just coming from that place of love and back to love and money. This should not be this difficult. And people up here, you shouldn't have that $260,000 that really needs to be 269 and no one has eaten anything. And you've just paid people or not really paid people, but it doesn't take into consideration all the things that cost, all the expenses that there are. Um, we are going private right now for our survival and for Gunner's survival and for the survival of people who want to take part in that. I don't think, Mr. Nash, when you mentioned your 94-year-old father, and he's living in a retirement place, and my mom is 89, and she's living at Carroll Woods in Chapel Hill, which is saving her life, which is wonderful. Those are congregate settings. <laughs> we don't have any opinions about 80 and 90-year-olds and say, whoop. Don't put too many of them in the same place. <laughs> you know, like the, the homestead and the HCB and the laws and all the acronyms. I understand those have to exist. I understand there have to be rules. I understand that you know the, the good models in bad hands are bad models. 
there are some good models up here. And there's some good people up here. And um, Ann Osha, the work you're doing here is amazing. And Sue Manning online is Gunner's care coordinator lines, and she's amazing. She's wonderful. I mean, I stop talking, but I the waiver, the state of North Carolina can do better. We can we really can do better. And I know that's not what this conversation is about, but I'm listening to Donna and Michelle, and I'm sitting in your space today. And you're on your kids are on the waiting list, right? And there are other people in this room, your kids are on the waiting list. That is a crisis. I'm going to stop talking. We were fortunate in 1999. We got here. We were at Sand Hills Children's Center. Mary Sonnenberg, who I think moved to Virginia, she's long retired now. But the, one of the first things she said to us when we met her was, I would like to put Cap or Gunner on the Cap waiting list. I'll tell you about it later. And Gunner went to meet Elena Aponte, who was his two and three year old classroom teacher. And as we're walking out, we're holding Gunner. He's not even two years old yet. Mary had put Gunner on the Cap waiting list. Within 18 months, he was on the waiver. He is 27 years old. Except that is part of the problem. That is, it, it is not just about housing. It is not right. just about the innovations waiver. It is not just about state funded or any other resource. It is all part of the same whole. And if we don't start looking at it as one part of everything, and we keep piecing it out into little pieces here, we will continue to have meeting after meeting that I have attended for 10 years and we still haven't made much progress between between October of last year and uh, the end of May. We added fifteen hundred people to the Innovations Waiver waitlist. Fifteen hundred were added. How many of those people need housing? You you can't split the pieces out. We do it because it's too big to the, in our minds to, to start spite, slicing all these pieces off. We can't deal with the whole thing. And yet it is a whole issue. And if we don't start looking at it that way, we will continue to nickel and dime until we shrug our shoulders and say, well, we can't do this. And I, I am firmly of the opinion we can. I don't think it's going to be easy. The longer we wait, the more costly and the more complicated it gets. But housing is not separated from innovations waiver, nor from state funded services, nor for what it's worth from employment issues and transportation issues. That was that was the whole promise of Taylor Care Management. Let's deal with the whole person. Let's deal with the whole <laughs> IDD family member. And for that matter, our whole family, because there is no such thing as one neurodiverse person in a family. There is, I have two sons on the spectrum, my entire family. I've got five kids and four grandkids. We are all neurodiverse. <laughs> and if you don't think that way, someday let me know. You can come have dinner with me when the family's around and you'll see it. It is not something that you can separate out. Why should we? Let's look at the whole piece and then tackle it. Right, so, so we haven't heard from Dee online. She's uh, got a project going on also. So if she's there, can, can we get her up? Yeah. Yeah, I've never thought of my job was typically to be here. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's, that's great support right there. Um, so one of the last things here on this list is more parent groups might come together and build housing, but they don't know each other. There's a lot of groups out there. Um, Doing this. There's a, a We Built community in uh, North Wilkesboro, which started in Oregon. Um, and if you go on their website, the, the lady that did this has one of my favorite. I'm going to ruin her quote. <laughs> but she kept asking questions and got a no, but she kept asking until she got a yes. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. Keep asking until we get a yes. Is Representative Donna White still online? I see her name, but we might invite her to comment if she's not falling asleep on us. <laughs> I have definitely not fallen asleep. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, 
I I was um, reading some of the notes that I was making. So could you could you make that comment again? What do I need to respond to? Sure. Actually, let me just, let me just say I I do have a couple of things that I would like to respond to. Please. Um, first of all, and and I hope you all take this very um, lovingly because I know that you live this every day. It's not just when you come to a conference. It's not when you approach legislators. It's not when you do anything else in your life. This this is your life. I've, I've heard so many of you reference your family members that are impacted. Uh, so I know this is a personal issue. Um, I have been involved because I'm a public health nurse and that's all I know how to do. And my whole life I have worked with um, communities that needed special assistance, whether that be folks without husbands, uh, children without fathers or mothers, um, the IDD community. This has been a lifelong work for me and it started way before I became a legislator seven and a half years ago. So that's why I'm very involved and want to continue to be involved uh, with the IDD community and to help you all in any way that I can. And I think I've demonstrated that by my votes and my bills that I've run. I do know that uh, there seems to be a more intense interest in the General Assembly now, seven and a half years since I've been there, than it was when I came. Most people in the most legislators that I worked with when I first came really were not familiar with what IDD was, um, unless they had had some kind of personal family, you know, relation uh, issue. So, um, but what I'm hearing today, and I've, I've been sitting here for about three hours now listening. It seems like to me that y'all are divided, that you, you know, everybody's got their little niche and their concern, but again, it's not, it's not a whole package. And I don't know how you approach legislators, but like I said, seven and a half years ago, there were many legislators that are there now that are that are with us now that maybe didn't know a thing about IDD. And there's some that's coming in now that seems to be a little bit more aware because there's been a lot more education in the last seven and a half years. There's been a lot more involvement by some of your, your constituents and your, and your organizations, and that's all good. But when you go to a legislator that is dealing with 50 other topics in a day, and you rush in and you maybe get 15 minutes or 20 minutes, you've got to be united and you've got to have a package and then you've got to say this is what we need what they've been hearing is that you need innovation waivers well every year for the last three years we have increased those i'm not sure that all of the people that have put been put on that opportunity is actually getting service because we don't have the dsp workers to put in those facilities and those individual homes and those individual apartments or, or you know, the group homes or whatever. We just don't have the deep DSP workers. Um, COVID, you know, kind of, we, we were already in a in an arrear. And then when COVID came, it really just hit us like a bomb. Um, and then we've had, so we've had a lot of uh, older people that just do not feel comfortable working in the care community anymore, whether it's um, in ICF or skilled facilities or home care, home health. So all of the all of the industry that is a caregiving model uh, does not have enough employees. So that is a huge issue. But when we continue to increase, we could have put in more slots this in the short session in 2023. And I will tell you that the six health chairs, three from the Senate, three from the House, spent probably a half a day discussing that topic. But we thought, why do we put more innovation waivers out there when we know we don't have the DSP employees to to staff it? So let's let's do what we can, but let's don't throw money at something that we know we can't do anything about right now, because we were told in our we were only given three things and a category that we could choose from to, uh, and this is health appropriations, not the full non-appropriation chairs, but health appropriations. We were told we could do three things this year, this 23, 24. And so one of ours was to make sure that we gave more innovation waiver slots. There were, but we could not address the DSP workforce. So we knew that we were probably throwing numbers at something, but we were not actually gonna be able to make that come to, to fruition. But it was a very, very, we were given very tight, tight instructions and we could only choose two, three things 
And when we chose our first two things, we were out of money. That That's the Health Appropriations Committee, uh, not the Joint Health Appropriations Committee, three senators, three, three reps. So I'm just saying that as we move forward into a full year, a, a full budget year of 25, Y'all work together and find out really, you know, maybe choose the top three or four things and give us real direct, you know, guidelines about what can be done from all of your viewpoints. And if you want to, I know, and I really appreciate the comments about how you just can't think about health care. You've got to think about um, custodial care. You've got to think about uh, housing. You've got to think about think about land. And um, I am from Johnson County, so I really appreciate the efforts that's been made on Highway 70 East, uh, close to Smithfield, to open up those 10 uh, units. Very pleased with that. Hope that we can replicate that across the state. So I'm there for you, whatever you need me to do to help with that. Um, but I'm, I'm just saying we need to have a more united front and not do a lot of piecemeal because you're talking to people when you're talking to legislators that are, are getting 50 to 100 asked a day, and that is modest sometimes. That that statement is sometimes modest. It's even more than that. And so you've got to, and when you're looking, when you're looking at a population that is, my concern, I'm, I'm starting two sentences there, but I'm just going to go to my concern. I know as an aging person, we're all aging, but some of us are more aging than others. Um, and you know that you've got this dependent person that is your child. Um, and you look to the future and you think, what is going to happen when I'm not here? And that is probably what makes me, every time I think about IDD, that's what I think about, is what's going to happen when when the aging population is, is no longer able to take care of that uh, dependent uh, family member. And I know that many of you have been uh, fortunate enough to be in good positions to plan for that in the future. But again, the planning and the money, if we don't have the services, if we don't have the place for them to be served in, you know, is we're, we're, we're lose, they're losing out. We're all losing out. So I just make my pledge to you all. I'm definitely, um, if I continue to be reelected, and I don't know, you know, I may not be here after November. <laughs> you know, we, ne we never can promise anything after November. So, uh, but as long as I'm here, I will be glad to be your voice and I will be glad to do anything I can to pull us all together and maybe have an incremental plan so that we get one thing accomplished and then we go to the next. But we need to be together with one voice because I hear a lot of, a lot of folks talking on different issues and on each of the issues, there's a, a wide range of opinions about how to, how to deal with it. So anyway, I hope I haven't offended anyone. It's been an honor to be with you all for the last three hours. And I look forward to uh, being, being there for many of your other, your other meetings. You have a Thank blessed you. day. Thank you. Um, it is 1202. Oh. I, I guess I need to close out. Um, a couple of points I, I just want to make. Um, several years ago, the wait list was a little over 12,000 people. <laughs> now it's over 17,000 people, so we're not keeping up with the population. Um, to me, that's an issue. My son is on the wait list. And eight years, eight and a half years now. Some people, 14 years. Um, so the Fed actually pays two thirds of that. And we pay a third, so there is some money coming in if we get more people on the red list. Of course, there's more money going out. <clears throat> um, but I want to thank everybody for coming out today, uh, especially the Alliance staff for the support. <clears throat> that they gave us. And I want to thank the panel. And everybody that came out, uh, Tally, John, Ann, Marshall, um, some of the Alliance board members are here from, D and from DHHS. Um, I just appreciate your efforts here and the discussion. And I think we've got this room until they kick us out. So if you want to. <laughs> And thanks to Carol Conway yeah. for organizing that. Yeah. <laughs>
before you adjourn, is it possible for me to say something? Sure. Thank you so much. My name is Commissioner Lee Altman. I serve at large in Mecklenburg County. Um, I um, have listened and learned a lot. I didn't hear every single moment. So in case I missed this, I just want to repeat it for the people in the room. You know, um, it's really important that you like, I mean, the legislators at the state level are really busy. Your county commissioners and your city council members are pretty overwhelmed with all kinds of extremely diverse substantive needs and demands and the level of expertise to understand all that stuff. You know, we're all just sort of working to keep up. So, you, you know, the more you can make our job easier, the more we can deliver for you. So like if you were to come up with, you know, on a county, even a county by county method, like here's the number of people in your county or in your city on the IDD wait list. And, you know, here are the number of units available for them that have been set aside in your county. And, you know, when the next time the, the city, the city does affordable housing in Mecklenburg County, they have a you know, multi-million dollar bond, tens of millions of dollars every year that they get to spend to create affordable housing. And so in Mecklenburg County, it would, you know, for example, it would be good for the advocates in Mecklenburg County to develop relationships with city council people and to sign up to speak at the public forum um, to educate. And whenever there's a, you know, a new plan for another building that's going to be built with public funds, that's the time to be asking these people to meet you in the community or going to meet with them one-on-one -on -one at their offices or showing up in public forums, like that kind of ground game um, that meanwhile, you're giving them data and statistics that are specific for their city or their county is something that I would just highly, highly recommend. Um, and if there are, you know, there are a lot of things that we want to do, but as a Dillon rule state, there's a, most of it we can't do. So if you can, Tell us, you know, since this is your area of expertise, you know, help us know what we actually can do that we aren't doing and sort of deliver that on a platter to your local elected officials. Then you're removing the barriers to action because you've done the homework and the hard legwork of what isn't done in this community. What are the needs in the community? And here's what you have a power to do. So can you please do it? I know, for example, in my county, we would love to support better, um, but it's the bandwidth of figuring out for all these different things. You know, if if you can help us and and maybe try to do that at least on an annual basis, like come up with a new ask every year at the local level that we can do that, you know, like, please help us help you. Because I know, for example, my board would be very, very wanting to. It's just, you know, understanding what you know, what we can do um, as a matter of power and authority and then doing it. So thank you for um, the time. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, this is Carol, I guess I get the last word. Um, we will be doing a white paper coming out of this. Um, this is recorded, the chat will be saved. Um, I don't know if that's gonna be available generally, but I'll be going through it, doing the white paper. And um, I do like Laura's, you know, I see potential in Laura's little group of housing initiatives to be a brain trust for all the parent-led groups. Um, and I do think we need to go on several tracks, doing the non-state-funded track, <laughs> changing state rates, um, while building a long-term case for state funding. Um, anyway, I keep sending me emails. Um, your thoughts will be appreciated. Uh, and thank you, join David. Thank you so much for being here. Awesome. Thank you.